Chairman, we're now live. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Can we come towards, please, for the committee? Uh, welcome uh, to uh, the, the meeting tonight and uh, the viewers watching on the Council website, London Hillingdon. My name is Councillor Henry Higgins and I'm the chairman of this committee. Um, details of business to be considered today are shown on the agenda. Yeah, can people please make sure their mobile devices are turned off? That comes later. Um, yeah, for those present in the room intending to speak, please note that you will be filmed. We've got something. Yeah, can you hear? Can you hear now? Is that better? No. Is that better? <laughs> okay. Right. I'll try and drag it over. Can you hear me now? Everybody. So we start again, shall we? Welcome to the planning committee tonight. This is the borough planning committee, um, and thank you for attending. Uh, you can also view this online on YouTube channel Hillington London. My name is Councillor Henry Higgins and I'm the chairman of this meeting. Uh, the details of business to be considered today are shown on the agendas and copies of which are accessible in the room and on the, underneath the live broadcast. For those presenting in the room and intend to speak, please note that you will be filmed and any statement that you make will be recorded and made public. A reminder to anybody speaking today that your voice will only be audible when the online microphone is turned on. We're not expecting a fire alarm today, so if the fire alarm does go, please follow officers out of the building. Those who have mobile or tablet devices in the room, can they please make sure they're switched off? As a committee, we are trying to go paperless, so you can forgive me, I'm trying to do this all from my device in front of me. And other members of the committee have, com have had their computers and laptops. There's other copies of the agenda which are just outside. Um, now, I'll give you, before we go to the agenda, I would like to introduce the councillors and officers present. Um, uh, Councillor Steve Tuckwell is my vice chairman. Yes, if you, I think if councillors today, if you can stick up your hands, because usually you face the committee, so it'll be good. Uh, Councillor Philip Cawthorne. Councillor Gohill. Councillor Mann. Councillor Sansapuri. And Councillor Singh. Thank you very much. Officers are uh, Ros Johnson, who's sitting next to me. Noel Kelly, Kate Crosby, Fiona Ray, who is a planning team leader as well, Michael Bringshaw, he's a principal planning officer, Nisha Burnham, a principal planning officer, Alan Tinney, our transport and planning manager. No, he's not Sophie today, sorry, beg your pardon, Sophie will not welcome to your first committee, welcome. Also, uh, Glenn Eagle, my legal advisor over there, thank you very much, and Liz Penny, who makes sure that I do everything correctly, and um, is, head of, uh, is, is part of the Democratic Service Office team. Okay, so we'll go straight to the agenda. Apologies for absence. <laughs> Sorry, Chairman. Um, apologies have been received from Councillor Shubadar with Councillor Philip Cawthorne substituting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cawthorne, for stepping in. Uh, declaration of interest matters before us in the meeting, anybody? Nope. Okay. Uh, to receive the, and agree the minutes of the last meeting. I also just like Ros to come in about uh, to show how effective we are as a committee. Look, last time we were asked to write a letter. Then do you want to... Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yes, yeah, so just um, you were referring to the letter that you asked me to write in connection with the Rise Lip telephone exchange application, just to confirm that that has been sent, um, and that was in connection with advising the applicant for future submissions in terms of what additional information the committee would expect to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, matters notified in advance or urgent? There are none. And to confirm that... Uh, it's a public and private reports and everything is in public today. And to remain, remind everyone, this is a public meeting, not a pub meeting in public. I think that's the right way around. Okay, so we'll move on to the agenda. Um, then I'll d t discuss before petitioners what your procedure is for that. So who's, is it Michael, who's going to take us away first? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just before we start, members should note that there is an addendum uh, for this item number six, which updates the petition numbers um, in objection to the scheme. Uh, 
So, um, item six relates to the Northwood Police Station, uh, located on the corner of the junction between Maxwell Road and Murray Road. Uh, Maxwell Road can be seen on the western side of the plan, uh, leading to Green Lane to the north, and Murray Road can be seen on the eastern side of the plan, intersecting with Maxwell Road. So this is the constraints plan. Um, so Norfolk Police Station is a Grade Two listed heritage asset, <coughs> and is highlighted by the red colour layer on the slide um, in the middle. So the site forms part of the Green Lane Conservation Area and falls within the Norfolk Town Centre boundary. It is located a, sh a short distance to the south of the Green Lane Primary Shopping Area, shown in blue, and the surrounding roads are covered by a parking management scheme. So, uh, within the wider area, there are two air quality focus areas. These are areas where the levels of nitrogen dioxide exceed the acceptable limit values, have high human exposure, and the current plan measures are insufficient to resolve the poor air quality issues. The site is outlined in red, with the Northwood East uh, focus area declared 500 metres to the east, and the Northwood West focus area declared 300 metres to the west. So here you can see the site um, from a bird's eye view. And here are some external site photos. So this is the, um, the northeast of ele elevation, which shows the primary pedestrian access to the building taken from Murray Road. And this is the northwestern elevation, which shows the secondary pedestrian access uh, outlined in red, um, taken from Maxwell Road. So this is the southwest elevation from within the site. And this is, the, again, the southwest elevation, but of the eastern wing uh, from within the site as well. Uh, this shows the car parking within the site adjoining the building the car parking adjoining the Maxwell Road properties. Uh, again, same car parking. So, although the spaces are not marked out on the ground, it is understood that the, this area of the site outlined in red um, has previously been used for car parking and is, is proposed to be used for accessible parking under the current application. Um, this is a picture of the, uh, again, the the car parking area, but as seen from the vehicle access um, taken from Murray Road. Um, so this shows the closest neighbouring properties to the southeast at numbers 4 to 6B Murray Road. Um, and this shows the other closest neighbouring properties to the southwest at numbers 29 and 31 Maxwell Road. This is the only vehicle access into the site, uh, taken from Murray Road, and it measures approximately 3.2 metres in width. Uh, this is Murray Road, uh, with the parking management scheme road signs outlined in red, with restrictions from Monday to Friday between the hours of 1pm and 2pm. And this is Maxwell Road, which has a parking management scheme in place for pay and display parking from Monday to Saturday between 8 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. On town, at the town centre end of the road and further down. Um, there are restrictions, again, from Monday to Friday between the hours of 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. So this is a photo of the Maxwell Road and Murray Road Junction taken from Murray Road. And this is, the um, again, the Maxwell Road and Murray Road Junction, but taken from Maxwell Road. And you can see the site, the application site in the background there. This is the service access uh, for the Waitrose and the Maxwell Road Parade of Shops. Uh, and this is located opposite the application site. And this is the Waitrose car park, uh, which is located a short distance further down Murray Road uh, from the application site. So item six specifically relates to the full planning application for the change of use of the former police station to a mixed use place of worship and a community centre alongside alterations to the car parking layout. Uh, this slide shows the existing floor plans with the ground floor at the bottom left, um, first floor at the top left, uh, second floor at the bottom right, and the roof plan at the top right. Um, this shows the existing um, front and side elevations, with the front elevation at the top and the side elevation at the bottom. 
And this is the existing rear and side elevations, again with the rear at the top and the side at the bottom of the screen. So this shows the um, proposed site plan showing the car parking would be formally marked out to provide 14 car parking spaces, including two accessible spaces. It is noted that one parking space is also located outside the main car parking area adjoining Murray Road to total 15 spaces. I can try and, that's where it is there. Um, so this slide shows the proposed ground floor plan, the proposed first floor plan, and the proposed second floor plan. Uh, these plans have been submitted to show the detail of the layout proposed to facilitate the change of use. It is emphasized that the internal changes proposed are subject to the listed building consent application, and we'll be discussing more detail under item seven, which is to follow. So moving on to highways considerations. Um, so this shows the schedule of existing and future activities submitted under Appendix B of the planning statement. The activities highlighted in yellow are the ones which would either overlap to generate higher numbers of attendees, or the single activity itself would generate in, uh, would gener would result in a higher number of attendees. Um, this includes Friday prayer with up to 100 attendees, the scouts group uh, and tutoring with up to 90 attendees, um, guest lectures with up to 50 attendees, quiz nights with up to 75, uh, education combining with food bank delivery with up to 70, and interfaith activities combining with youth club with up to 80 attendees. So uh, this graph as well as the graphs on the following slides have been created by the local planning authority using the information submitted by the applicant. I uh, just want to make that clear that it's, it's, it's a production, um, it's, it's, it's what the local planning authority have created, not, not the applicant. Um, this graph shows the minimum, maximum, and average number of attendees across the week according to Appendix B. As can be seen, the site would be used less on Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday, and would be used more on Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday of attendee numbers peaking at 200 in one day on Friday and Saturday. So uh, this graph shows the number of attendees generated by the proposal across the day for each day of the week using the higher attendee numbers cited in Appendix B. The graph starts at 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. On, on the left hand side and finishes at 11 p.m. to 12 a.m. on the right hand side of the graph. As can be seen, there would be low usage between the hours of 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. The use of the site would then increase between the hours of 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., peaking at 100 for Friday prayer. The next most intense use of the site would be on Tuesday and Thursday between the hours of 6 p.m. and 7 p.m., with attendee numbers peaking at 90. There could also be similar numbers on Saturday during the evening period. Uh, attendee numbers would decrease, and between the hours of 10 p.m. and 12 a.m., the site would be used for prayer for up to 25 people. So the application submission has cited a number of different modal split values for users of the site. This graph shows the numbers uh, of cars anticipated from the proposal across the week based on the private car mode share of 9% cited within the October 2022 travel survey, 30% cited within the August 2021 transport statement, 58% cited within the Transport for London's Travel in London report number 13, dated 2020 for Hillingdon, and 75% cited within the June 2021 response to transport consultation document. So in the worst case scenario, the 9% figure would not generate more than 20 cars on any day of the week. If the 30% figure is used, the number of cars would peak at 60, if 58% is used, the number of cars would peak at 116. And if 75% is used, it would peak at 150. Um, these figures have been provided at different stages in the application process. And it is understood that the 9% figure is the applicant team's final position as submitted within the October 2020 travel survey. So as covered within the committee report, 9% mode share figure is only applicable to the religious element of the proposal and is not strictly applicable to the community use proposed. The Highways Authority also do not consider a 9% private car mode share to be robust. The 75% mode share figure is also considered to be high and is superseded by the applicant's latest submissions. A private car mode share between the figures of 30% and 58% 
is considered to be more representative and would generate a significant number of trips in the worst case scenario specifically. So this shows the number of cars the proposal could generate across the day for a 30% private car mode share. Based on this, the most intense use of the site will generate up to 30 cars in the early afternoon and up to 21 cars in the early evening hours. Um, this shows the number of cars the proposal could generate across the day for 58% private car mode share. Under this mode share, the most intense use of the site would generate up to 58 cars in the early afternoon and up to 52 in the early evening hours. In the worst case scenario, this would significantly exceed on-site car parking provisions. And moving on. So in terms of worst case scenario, um, the transport information submitted is assessed on the basis that development would be occupied by approximately 100 people in the worst case scenario. Following co correspondence with the applicant team, it is understood that the maximum physical capacity of the building would be 292 based on table C1 of approved document B of the building regulations. The applicant team caveats that the sanitary capacity of the building is closer to 200. So based on this, in the worst case scenario, the maximum capacity is considered to be between 200 and 292 people, this being two to three times the worst case scenario presented within the application submission. And this raises significant concerns. So in addition to understanding the trips generated by the proposal, it is, a, it is critical to understand how such impacts could be mitigated. A number of points are considered within the committee report. So a draft car parking management strategy has been submitted and explains that there will be an application process for activities at the site to avoid schedule conflicts. There would also be an online booking system for on-site parking with priorities for staff, elderly and disabled visitors. The remaining spaces would be awarded on a first come first serve basis. During well, more well attended events, this could result in conflict between visitors who have tried to park on site but not found a space, noting that the vehicle access is only wide enough for one car and that car users may have to reverse out of the narrow access onto the highway against the highway code and to the detriment of highway user safety. Visitors would also be encouraged to use local public car parks. Officers are concerned that the proposal would be relying on third party provisions outside the remit of the application. The provision of these car parks cannot be controlled by this application and cannot be guaranteed in perpetuity. Pick up and drop off um, from surrounding roads is cited as one of the ways parking demand on the local network would be mitigated for certain activities. However, officers consider it more likely, especially, especially for scouts groups activities, that parents would carry out an accompanied pick up and drop off, requiring that vehicles are parked on street. This would also be at a time of the evening when on street parking would be at peak occupancy with commuters having returned home. The applicant team has submitted a draft travel plan which would be used to encourage more sustainable forms of travel. Officers do not doubt the applicant team's commitment to the travel plan, but do have con concerns that this would rely too much on soft measures, which would not guarantee that visitors change their travel behavior. Although there is reference to the provision of eight cycle parking spaces, it is not considered that the proposed internal cycle store would have sufficient room for such provisions. This is a concern given the proposed reliance on sustainable forms of transport to justify the scheme. Officers understand that fatal and serious incidents have been reported within 12 minute walk of the site. In accordance with planning policy requirements, there should have been an assessment of the surrounding network for highway improvements in order to support the position that the development would encourage more active and sustainable forms of transport to and from the site. Ideally, the physical capacity of the building would provide a natural cap on attendance numbers with an acceptable threshold. However, as previously noted, the maximum attendance could extend to between 200 and 292 which is considered to be significant. A planning condition for capping attendance numbers has been considered, but it is concluded that it would not be enforceable, and um, I note that it's also not agreeable to the applicant team. So, in summary, the application submission fails to fully demonstrate the proposal would not give rise to adverse impacts upon the highway network to the detriment of traffic congestion, parking stress, and highway safety. The proposed development would, or is considered, to have an unacceptable impact on highway safety and represents a significant conflict with planning policy sufficient to warrant a reason for refusal. Um, 
Moving on to air quality. So as previously noted, the application site is located between the Norfolk West focus area and Norfolk East focus area. These are areas where the levels of nitrogen dioxide exceed the acceptable limit values and have high human exposure uh, and the current plan measures are insufficient to resolve the poor air quality issues. The council's air quality officer has assessed the application and concluded that development would contribute to the production of unacceptable pollutant emissions in these focus areas. There is uncertainty in the number of vehicle movements associated with the development, but based on the information submitted, the proposal would not be air quality neutral or air quality positive. The measures proposed on site are not sufficient to mitigate the emissions produced, and the applicant team has not agreed to pay a financial contribution in order to support the implementation, implementation of air quality mitigation measures within the focus areas. This, rep this represents a conflict with planning policy. So to conclude, officers have balanced the material planning considerations both for and against the proposed development. The proposal would provide a place of worship and community facility which would generate inevitable public benefit. The change of use would also secure the long-term future of the heritage asset. These factors weigh in favour of, of the proposal. In respect of highways, officers have engaged with the applicant team in order to better understand and mitigate the impact associated with the proposal. Despite this, and based on the information submitted, the proposed development is considered to be unacceptable or have an unacceptable impact on highway safety and represents a significant conflict with planning policy sufficient to warrant a reason for refusal. The proposed development would also contribute to the production of unacceptable pollution emissions in the Northwood air quality focus areas without sufficient mitigation. This represents a conflict with planning policy sufficient to warrant a reason for refusal. The benefits associated with the proposal are not considered sufficient to outweigh uh, the harm posed in respect of highway safety and air quality. As the development is recommended for refusal, officers have also added a reason for refusal for failing to secure mitigation via a Section 106 legal agreement. For the reasons outlined within the report, the full planning application is recommended for, for refusal. I pass back to you, Chairman. Michael, thank you very much. Um, we've had a few late attendees. Can you may please make sure that your mobile phones are off or on silent? Okay. Um, we're going to go to the petitioners now. Um, the system's quite easy. We have a traffic light system in front of me. It starts off at green. It's for four minutes. And when it goes to amber, you've got one minute. And red, it goes red, means that you have to stop. And I will stop you. So please don't think I'm being rude. That's the way I am. Very strict about times. So, first of all, we have the uh, Brian, is it Greenham? Hello, Brian. Uh, welcome to the committee. You have your five minutes. As soon as, you, as soon as you start, we'll time you. Thank you. As the lead petitioner, I and over 300 fellow petitioners would ask you to accept that our objections are based purely on the grounds of traffic congestion, noise, and air pollution. Slide one, please. As you will see from my first slide, we residents already experience major traffic problems and allowing this change of use will have a major adverse impact on traffic congestion, safety and the health of all Northwood residents for generations to come. The Iron Aid Foundation have stated that the premises will be a place of worship that will attract worshippers from outside Northwood as well as those within and will be in constant use from before dawn until before midnight. They give projected numbers of 100 plus attendees at some daily activities, including Friday prayers and festivals, and they intend to have seven rooms available for rental throughout the day up until late into the evening to accommodate the many varied activities they seek to provide and operate, many of which will overlap with prayer sessions. To justify the expected high numbers of attendees, they seek to convince you that as many as 50 police personnel worked at the station prior to its closure in 2019. I know from personal knowledge that since 2002, when community policing was introduced, there was only ever one sergeant and five police officers working out of Northwood Police Station, and they would be split on different shift patterns, earlies and lates. Yes, from time to time, CID units would utilize the empty offices, albeit short-lived for special major crime investigations. Northwood Police Station was never a 24-hour police facility, which is why the police telephone box was placed outside the front entrance with an out-of-hours phone connection to Uxbridge Police Station. The IAF traffic survey seeks to dispel congestion issues 
by stating that once their 15 car parking spaces are occupied, other attendees will either walk or use public transport or the public LBH car park in Green Lane. Slide two, please. Please look at the second slide, because the IAF think it's reasonable to allow drop-off and pick-up in the immediate area of the police station. But this is a restricted parking zone, with no parking between 8 a.m. and, 8 and 6.30 p.m., Monday to Saturday, and it will inevitably be a major congestion problem. It's very likely that drop-off pick-up drivers will come into con in conflict with shoppers using the Waitrose car park, which is in constant use from 8 a.m. until 8.30 p.m. and is situated almost immediately opposite the entrance to the police station car park. There are obvious dangers with people and children crossing this busy junction, especially so when parents are parked as close as possible to the premises waiting to pick up their children or others. The IAF say that they have been actively worshipping at St John's Church in Hallowell Road for over 10 years without making an impact on the community, but that is outside the central conservation area. If these applications are granted, the extra traffic will impact on central Northwood and add to car emissions causing more air pollution. Northwood Town Centre is already at saturation point with heavy traffic throughout the day. And that's about to get a lot worse. Slide three, please. Please look at my third slide, which illustrates the actions of Hertfordshire County Council, who have given planning consent for the building of numerous apartment blocks on Eastbury Avenue, which is regarded as part of the Northwood community. There are currently six blocks of apartments under construction, providing 80 two-bedroom flats with 160 car parking spaces. Northwood's population is about to explode, and that means more drivers making their shopping trips into central Northwood. Slide four, please. In my final slide, you can see that two blocks have already been completed, and very soon we'll be seeing many of these new Northwood residents in their 160 vehicles fighting for the limited car parking spaces in central Northwood. This is yet another reason why the IAF should not be allowed to add to the increased traffic congestion we're about to suffer. For all the reasons I've stated, we petitioners urge you to follow the planning officer's recommendation and refuse planning consent for both these applications. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Well timed. Um, OK, uh, we have um, the applicant and the agent, Mr. Zanam and Mr. Young. You're going to share your time. Is that what's happening here? Yes, that's okay? fine, if that's OK with you, Chair. Yeah, fine, no problem. Whenever you're ready. Chairman, members, uh, broad principles remain at the heart of the planning system. And what are the broad principles here? This is an existing organisation operating in Northwood for 12 years, just 200 metres from the police station, doing nothing but good, no complaints. A decade-long property requirement, premises in which to flourish, liaising with this council previously to find solutions to that. This council's agreement that there are insufficient faith and community facilities and planning policies devised specifically to address that and a vacant public building listed in need of renovation, a purpose and long-term custodian. So what could make more sense, members, than taking that organization and putting them in that vacant building? Such opportunities are rare. The objections you've heard just now are wholly unfounded, hearsay, conjecture. Far from causing problems, this proposal fixes existing ones. There's no parking available to the INA Foundation at St John's Church, yet at the police station there's 15 spaces. There are no planning restrictions on the operation at St John's Church, whereas controls are proposed at the police station over bookings, noise and timings. And currently the congregation travel and park where they please, whereas the proposal obligates travel targets and parking management. Several clarifications for you members. First, your officers instructed external consultants to review this, but significant fault they could not find. 
Second, the policy threshold for refusal on traffic grounds is severe cumulative impact. There's no mention of that in the report. Third, whilst we dispute the need for air quality mitigation, our client agrees to pay the contribution should you resolve to grant planning permission this evening. Fourth, the graphs you were shown just now showed attendees across the day, not the maximum. And the maximum capacity was calculated by officers purely as a theoretical exercise based on the building regulations. Chairman, members, the Council's policies specifically direct this use to this site and if, as we've just heard, there's going to be a population explosion in Northwood, well, then there better be good community facilities to support it. Broad principles are met in abundance here, and there's no policy basis for objection. Planning permission must therefore be granted. Chairman, members, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tarek Zaman. I'm a North consultant orthopaedic surgeon based in London Northwest Healthcare, and I'm currently the chairman of INA Charity, which we formally registered in 2010. We're in total six trustees from diverse professional backgrounds, united by a bizarre desire to help the community. Uh, we're all working in full-time jobs, and we thought we'd come together and do some good. Simple as that. Prayer is important, but it represents, we, we found, that a small fraction of the planned centre activities. We have a proven track record of helping those in need. We've funded life-saving and life-changing interventions. An example, the Paul Strickland Scanner Appeal, where we made substantial contributions uh, for the appeal. We've also raised 250,000 in the last five years alone, locally, for good causes. We're part of Hillingdon, and we continue to serve the local communities in the interest of social welfare. These include, at the moment, we are talking to Live at Home, which is a, a care for the elderly project, so, and joining forces with them. Over the last 12 years, we've developed a relationship based on mutual trust with and respect with St. John's Church and Reverend Phil's team, and we've not had any uh, complaints during that time. We've engaged positively with the council and the community. This is the, nearly in a two-year process. We've done everything asked of us and more detailed questionnaires demonstrating our minimal car dependency. Our activities do not overlap the peak traffic times of school drop-off and pick-up, I must emphasize. Later this evening, members of the congregation will attend prayers at St. John's. They'll, most will walk, some will cycle, and others drive, and we are local. In this context, we're disappointed at the reaction of certain parts of the community and their misrepresentation of the information supplied to the planning officers. Hearsay and supposition, I would say, is no place in planning, and we trust you will look beyond this. Our proposals have cross-faith support, St. John's, the synagogues, and other community leaders. Letters and signatures in support are over nearly 1,600 and substantially succeed, exceed those who object. The community wants us to succeed. Opening the police station to the community would make a world of difference. We respectfully ask you to support our work. And my dream, my personal dream, is that all members I'm of the sorry, community... I'm uh, sorry, your time is up. Yes, sorry. Okay. Last, last sentence. No, no, there's no okay, last sentence. that's fine. Let's finish. Before I go to committee, I'll just rather pick up some of the things that were said earlier. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, just a couple of points, um, starting with the uh, petition against. Um, so one of the matters that was um, touched on was noise. Just wanted to assist members by just giving some information regarding that. So um, as you will have noted, we're not recommending refusal um, in respect of noise. We have given a lot of careful consideration to this matter. That's included um, taking advice from the council's noise officer and also taking some advice from an external consultant. Um, after careful consideration, um, officers feel that mitigation measures could be put in place um, that would um, ensure an acceptable noise environment for neighboring residents. So we're satisfied on that point. Um, just Okay, just turning to the other points, so um, these were points uh, raised by the agent, so there has been reference to the use of the existing facility. I just thought it was worth pointing out that um, obviously each site is slightly different, so it's not sort of directly applicable. 
Um, and it would be important to note that the new site would allow a sort of an increase in the, in the use and in the types of um, community um, uses that could operate from there. So it would um, not be sort of directly applicable again, as I've said. And finally, um, the existing site that is currently being used would also remain and would remain available for, um, for similar uses as well. So it's an additional site. And then the final point that I thought might be worth clarifying. So there was reference to um, planning policy in respect of highway safety issues. I just wanted to draw members' attention to the MPPF and specifically paragraph 111. And I just wanted to read it out so that members are clear actually what it does say. And we refer to this in the report. Development should only be prevented or refused on highway grounds if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety or the residual cumulative impacts on a road network would be severe. So there was reference um, by the agent to this um, paragraph and I just wanted to read it out so that you had the information. And as you've seen from our presentation, we do have um, concerns that there would be an unacceptable impact on the highway safety. Thank you. Thank you, Ros. Uh, what I'm going to do, because we, we, we we're not usually in a disc room, to be honest, we're in a committee and we're all facing one another. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask committee first if they have any questions for the petitioner. So if you, uh, that's for you, Mr. Greener. Does anybody have a question? You do, Councillor Tuckwell. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> I hope you can hear me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got, I've got just one question and it's based on... I think the first slide that was, was put up, which gave us, an, and I think a couple of slides after as well, gave us an illustration of the congestion in, in Maxwell Road. I'd just like to ask the lead petitioner, who this is also a local resident, how often um, would you say that there is excessive congestion in Maxwell Road, and in particular that junction? Microphone, please. Thank you. That's all right. Don't worry. Just press one of the buttons. It'll, when it goes red, you know. No, the other one. There you go. Thank you. Um, Maxwell Road is central northward. Is extremely busy at all times of the day and night, very often. Uh, and and this this will cause problems in northward, without a doubt. Um, the fact is that we will see. Uh, lots and lots of congestion if this is approved. Um, I wonder whether you, know, you might have the opportunity of just re readdressing that question to me because I didn't expect to be answering questions at this point, I have to say. Okay. All it was, sir, was just to try and get from your perspective as a local resident, the picture shows a one-off example, just how often is, is that an illustration of how that particular junction is? Is it, is it once a day, twice a day, constant? Which is it? Just, just so that the committee can have a feel for how often that might, might be the case. Well, uh, if, 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 if you look at the, uh, the Maxwell Road map that's up there, you can see that uh, Northwood is, is a pretty congested area at all times of the day and often into the night. Uh, and uh, if, if, this is, if this is approved, then there will be more and more congestion, without a doubt. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No? Oh, Councillor Cawthorn. Not, not as the... No, no, I'm going to get to the next one. Okay, so, right. okay, so no one... No more. Okay, can you turn your microphone off for me, please? Thank, thank you. you. Okay, now, for the applicant and agent, Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you. Who's, would you like to address it to Mr Young or... Uh, it doesn't matter. You, you ask no, whether the question... Whoever's best place to respond, yes, if okay, that's okay, all right. Yes, that's um, uh, we've been presented with uh, quite a lot of information in relation to... Uh, likely numbers of attendees, vehicle movements at various times of the week and what have you. Uh, I understand those uh, figures have come from the applicant, i.e. yourselves. Can I just uh, understand the basis of those figures as they've been presented, where have they come from, what is the source and how have they been arrived at, please? Councillor, thank you. It's a very salient point. Um, they comprise two origins. The first is what happens presently. Um, in terms of uh, numbers attending prayer. And then the second part uh, is the um, expected numbers for future events. And, of course, that's very, very difficult to, to, to map out. And, of course, largely turns on the success that the Iron Aid Foundation has in, in running uh, those activities. Um, the, 
the discussion with officers has tended to focus on Friday prayers because, of course, that generates the most amount of um, uh, attraction to the building. Um, and that is expected to be in the vicinity of 100 persons. And it's worth just clarifying that the figures shown um, were um, not total people in the building at any one time, um, albeit 100 would be typical for Friday prayers, but I think the, the numbers that would attend the building over the course of an entire day, so that they, they weren't peak numbers. Um, so I think to answer your question, Friday prayers, 100 people is, is, is sort of the key target that we're looking at. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Gohill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and this could be a question to uh, either who, whoever wants to answer it. Um, my question is just surrounding, um, surrounding parking for particularly parking and, and or drop off if that's an option that is used for um, particularly mothers with young children and the disabled as well. Um, would it be, how would, how would that be mitigated if there wasn't space within the car park? I wouldn't typically expect uh, there to be kind of a drop off outside and young children running out. Often a mother would have to come open the safety lock, sorry, park up, open the safety lock, um, escort the children into the space. Um, and similarly, similarly with disabled people as well, um, I notice on item six, there's many, um, there's many activities like scout groups and youth clubs, etc., where where there could be, um, where there could be lots of young children, and uh, and in any case, there could be um, disabled people going. So, if you could please comment on that, and and also particularly on how you think this won't make an impact. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I think the most important response here is management. Um, this will be a managed building. The building will have a full-time building manager and the car park will always be opened and ready for known events. And as part of that management, um, and, and already in fact in use, particularly through COVID when the organisation needed to understand how many people were going to attend the building that they were using, um, is things like Eventbrite, which you know are sort of online tools to be able to book a parking space in advance so that there is knowledge of whether or not parking will be available on site. And that's crucial, of course, because before one sets out for, say, Friday prayer or evening prayers, you'll want to know whether or not there are parking spaces available. That system allows you to see, before you even leave home, whether that's uh, available or not. With the knowledge that there isn't parking available, because they've all been booked out within the car park, you, of course, can make alternative arrangements, whether that's driving to Green Park, um, sorry, Green Lane uh, car park or any other car parks, or, or making other travel plans. And just to reiterate, there is um, a lot of evidence of, of car sharing uh, already going on, not just uh, what we believe will happen in the future. You mentioned specifically um, children and um, those with disabilities. Um, there are disabled parking spaces within the car park uh, at the police station proposed, uh, and they would, of course, be reserved for those users. And, of course, um, because of the booking system, you know, those with children could obviously um, you know, get online and book those spaces in advance. As part of the management plan, once the car park is known to be full, um, uh, an A board or sign or the, the gate would be closed so that there is no congestion around the entrance to the site and that means it forces people not to, to, uh, to hover around the entrance to the site looking for a space because they know that the car park is already, is already closed. And then finally you mentioned sort of the, 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 the regime around um, drop-off um, for other events. Um, the, we're fortunate in that so many of the events that we're talking about here are evening events. Um, where things are generally a bit quieter in the evenings, that's certainly what we've observed, um, and the parking restrictions in the area actually s help serve our situation because a quick drop-off can be made. It's a no-parking restriction, but it's, it's not a no-stopping restriction, and I think that's a really important distinction to make. One can stop quickly, drop off, and move on quickly, and that was probably quite common for things like the Scouts where parents are dropping off. Thank you. Is that okay, Councillor Go? Yeah. Okay, Councillor Tuckwell, you've got a question? Yeah, just, just something that sprung to mind um, following uh, the question from, from my colleague there and the answer, but um, the officer presentation mentioned soft measures um, to help uh, manage the parking, the excessive parking risk. And listening to what's just been heard there, um, 
some of that's through the online booking, Ever Brighter and the like. But I'd just be interested to sort of he hear a view on what hard measures might look like in the event that people just arrive anyway in what is going to be quite a tight junction. And uh, just building on what I heard earlier on about the p potential conflict with the access into the neighbouring uh, Waitrose car park. So I'd just be interested to hear a little bit more about your thoughts about what the hard measures might look like to support managing the traffic congestion in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, hard measures are very difficult to introduce in that location, and I think ultimately we um, have quite a, you know, a modest car park here, 15 spaces. You know, it's not an enormous car park, which means that we don't have an enormous number of um, turns and departures into that junction. I think if it was a bigger car park, you, you might be onto something there. Um, ultimately, the car park will be full quite quickly, I suspect, for an event, and that's where an A board goes up or the gates are shut, and so people know that, that they can't turn into the site. And I think that's the crucial thing, knowing that the car park is full before a manoeuvre is made into it. I think that's where the biggest risk lies. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cawthorn, you indicated. I did, and thank you for indulging me with a follow-up question. A further one occurred to me. And just, it's just this once. Just just once. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, this, um, I think I heard this correctly, a 30% uh, car share mode? Uh, in the context of the applicant submission. Just really want to understand more fully what that is and how it works. I would assume, perhaps you can correct me if I'm wrong, that that is an entirely voluntary arrangement and would be unenforceable, but can I just understand that more fully, please? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We're very fortunate that we're talking about uh, an organisation that already exists. It's already operating in uh, um, St. John's um, and has been there for many years. Um, so we had the ability to actually, you know, review what was going on currently. Um, and there is a, a high degree of car sharing, um, particularly for evening prayers when, you know, people are coming from home rather than perhaps from work or other events. Um, and we found that on average for those um, uh, prayers that uh, there were 2.7 persons per car on average. Um, which, you know, I, I found surprisingly high, it, but it's been backed up by the survey results that have been carried out. So there is an enormous amount of car sharing. In terms of your second point about enforceability of that, um, of course, um, we've been asked to submit and have submitted a green travel plan that sets out the targets to enhance that even further. Um, and there are penalty clauses within the travel plan um, that um, put our client under enormous pressure to meet those targets and to find the most effective way of moving people to and from the building. Okay. Um, I'm going to dodge myself as well. I've, I've got a question. Um, there's the, the, the road that's actually adjacent to the police station is actually it's a delivery road for the lorries to go into Waitrose to deliver their goods and also there's a road there that services uh, the shops as well and in th and that how that will affect your drop-off area because th those vehicles do have to come right out yes quite right councillor that is the um, service access to, to Waitrose um, I've acted for a number of retailers over the years and, and actually the number of large HGV, as in articulated HGV movements to a store of this size uh, are not significant. Um, I'd say three or four maximum a day. Um, you then have obviously all the smaller delivery vehicles as well, but the, the, shit, the, the number of vehicle movements there is not significant. And again, there's a great deal of offsetting here in terms of when they're arriving versus when um, INA Foundation congregation are arriving. I don't see a, a, a huge opportunity for conflict. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so and there's no more questions. Um, I'll open it to the floor. Councillor Gohill and Councillor Tuckwell. Thanks, Chairman. Um, this application worries me slightly, um, just because of just because of the the sheer the sheer volume of the sort of uh, Proposed uh, proposed impact it could make on the local area. Um, from what I've seen in the pictures, I'm not familiar with the area, but it looks uh, it looks extremely busy in its current state to me. Um, and so, on a highways reason, I'm, I'm particularly concerned. Um, I on an on an air quality uh, on an air quality level as well. I'm also particularly concerned. Uh, I read in the report there were no, um, the applicant didn't, sorry, refused to, uh, 
refused to make agreements with the council to mitigate air quality. Is that is that correct? If the, if if someone could perhaps comment on that, that would be useful. And and also if um, and also if uh, we could get some further comments, perhaps from Sophie on uh, on the impact of um, on the impact of drop-offs in the area. That would also be uh, quite useful for me. Thank you. Sophie, do you want to, uh, Michael, who's going first? Michael? Uh, I can address yeah, the thanks. air quality point. Um, Hi, Michael. So in essence, um, the application has been reviewed by the council's air quality specialists. Um, and they have done a, an assessment of the transport information submitted. There wasn't an air quality assessment submitted at the start of the, of the process, but following discussions, they ended up submitting an air quality note. Um, in that note, they um, essentially contest uh, the points made by council officers that the the application would result in uh, um, you know net additional trips, um, and as a result, um, result in harm to these focus areas that are within the local area. Um, so that's you know, the council position is that it would result in net additional trips and that they should be mitigated in focus areas where there's unacceptable levels of um, pollution levels already. And the applicant team's position is that it would not result in net additional trips. That's my understanding. And as, as such, they don't agree to pay for, uh, you know, financial contr contributions towards um, air quality mit mitigation measures because they don't agree with, uh, you know, the principle of, of our request. Uh, so hopefully that clarifies that point. Thank you. Sophie, do you want to take the next one? Thank you, Chairman. Um, can you move? Um, I think our concern about the drop, it, it's not a formal drop off. It's reliant on the fact there'll be no parking restrictions at that time of day. Uh, so there could be other people parked there. You've got the impact of residents if people are parking even for a short time on street. As you say, there's going to be groups and users who have to physically get out of their car and accompany their child into the club or group, such as beavers, you know, scout leaders cannot just let the children go. They have to have a parent there to, to dismiss the child from the, from the group. So I think that's, that's the worry, is it's not a formal drop-off, so it's not just for the sole use of the site. It could be used by others. Um, sometimes there is parking restrictions there. So I think that's one of the safety concerns is how and where they park. Um, you'd hope people might think about using car parks, but I think a lot of, we, we know from local knowledge that people try to get as close as possible, especially if it's free to park. Um, so that's our concern in terms of dropping off near the site. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tuckmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, cu couple of points of, of <coughs> Of clarification for me, please. So, um, in the in the presentation, we had uh, a lot of numbers. Right, Councillor, I've, I've asked four times now for people to please turn their phones off. The app, can you make sure they're off, please? Sorry, Councillor Tucker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll start again. Um, yes, yeah, so we saw in the in the presentation uh, lots of numbers uh, thrown out as you know worst case scenario, uh, initial scenario. What I'd just like to get some clarification on is. How many cars are we expecting to, to visit this site? I know it's over the course of a different day, but on a maximum basis, because I've kind of, I know it was mentioned, but I kind of just need to pick up in my own mind exactly how many we're looking um, to, be, to be visiting, because um, there was models on, on basis of which one you picked. Um, the other point I just wanted to pick up, and it's something that Ros made earlier on, which was around noise concerns. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of ask, ask some clarification on that, because we have seen conditions for noise and disturbance applied on other applications. Uh, and I just wondered, you know, we've got neighbouring properties quite close to, uh, to this site, whether there is, there, there is scope, if we were so minded, for an additional refusal reason on the basis of noise and disturbance. As usual, it's a very good question, Councillor Tuckwell. <coughs> Who would like to take this? Now I could take the, the first question about car numbers. Okay. Um, I think th the problem is we have had a lot of different information. Um, and as you can see, it, it depending on what mode share we apply, we could see a various number of cars. Based on sort of our feelings, we think somewhere between the 30 and 58% mode share 
uh, which is the orange and grey on the, on the slide. So it would be somewhere between those levels. And if, if you're applying those to, say, 100 people at Friday Pairs, you could see anything between 30 and 58 cars during that time, depending on what mode share that you're, um, you're using. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I just come back yeah, on? Yeah, of course. Speak to Mr Chairman. So, so what I'm sort of looking at here is we're looking at probably anything between, I don't know, 50 and 60 vehicles. Um, okay, that might be in a, in, a, in, a, in a particular window with 14 pass parking spaces, an unofficial drop-off point, and HGV movements in the yard directly opposite. That's what we're, that's what we're looking at. Uh, yes, in summary, yeah. yes. And on a busy junction. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Councillor Mann. Finally got it working. Um, just a, a question uh, for the officers. Um, at the bottom of page 10 and, and the beginning of page 11 of the report, um, in respect of the highway matters, um, it mentions that um, the uh, information was requested from the applicant in order to better understand, I'm literally reading off it, likely impact of the proposed religious and community use. And it says information was received and it was concluded that the information was not sufficient. But then in the same paragraph, the report says there are doubts that sufficient information can be submitted anyway. So I just needed to, a little bit more clarification from the officers in regards to what kind of information was sought, what was acceptable, what was unacceptable, and is there any information that they still feel is lacking from the applicant? Okay. Michael? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, so, I mean, we've got um, comments from highways officers, a third party um, consultant in respect of highways as well, and then a, and a second set of highway authority comments, um, which detail um, the consideration of the application, the kind of information that we're looking for. One of the main points being, um, you know, a lot of the information focuses on Friday prayer uh, for good reason, uh, considering it potential attendee numbers. Um, but there's, there's a, a notable gap in the information in relation to community use, um, especially um, between the hours. You know, you've got the, the schedule uh, on, on, the, on the screen there. You've got um, use of the site between the hours of 6 and 7 p.m. And although you might note that that's not peak hours for movements, uh, movement of vehicles in, in the evening. It is, it is a time of the evening when there is peak occupancy of parking spaces on roads. Um, and that is, that is the time when, time of the evening when they are proposing these community use activities and they could, uh, as you can see there, in combination of um, scout group, um, educational tutoring, up to 90 attendees on site at, at that point in time. And we don't feel like that's been adequately assessed or or um, quantified as part of the submission. So that's, that's one of the main, the main points. Um, we, we also talk about worst case scenario, um, the worst case scenario being the, the, the physical capacity of the building. Um, we understand that they've given an indicative numbers of, you know, of, attendee, of attendees. Um, we don't know whether that would increase as a result of the proposal. Um, you know, obviously it's moving from one location to another. Um, it, it could be an intensification uh, or, or an increase in the, in the floor space um, from one site to the other. Um, so these numbers are indicative of, 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 of current usage. It, it, they are not necessarily indicative of, of you know, future anticipated usage. Um, and again, the physical capacity of the building is anywhere between 200 and 292. So that, you know, the assessment, the worst case scenario is what we're focusing on. Um, what we're required to focus on, um, we don't feel like it's been adequately assessed as part of the application submission. Okay, Councillor Mann, is that it's real? Yep. Councillor Caulfield, you have a question. Well, uh, it, uh, I think Councillor Mann has just asked it, actually. But, uh, oh, okay. At some point, I would like to comment, so, on the application. You can comment I'll, now. I'll speak now? Okay, fine. Just a few observations. I mean, I, I'll start with a general observation, and I, and I suppose there's a when we're weighing up the planning balance of applications, there's a tendency to take 
uh, the purported benefit at face value, i.e., you know, it, it's fostering good relations, it's meeting a need, and it's supporting community cohesion. The trouble is, when there's the level of uh, parking uh, and traffic-related tension and all the rest of it that comes into the mix, then actually those good relations that we're seeking to achieve get very much undermined. And so, in my head, I'm struggling to separate the two in a sense, although it's all part of that planning mix. Um, <laughs> I've listened to what's been said by the applicant, what's been presented here, and I've seen numbers that are purported to uh, attend or are likely to attend. Uh, I'm not sure how we can possibly know that they, these are the true figures, to be honest. Uh, I don't know how, uh, once consented, if indeed we were minded to consent this, that we could keep any kind of handle on it. That, that, that's the worry, and, and how it would play out on the ground. Uh, that's the concern I've got. So vehicle movements, attendees, I'm not sure how we can know how that works. I mean, I think the applicant has acknowledged that the arrangements that would be in place would be entirely voluntary. So, well, that may or may not work on the ground, but of course, once the decision is made, that, that's it. Um, and it's unusual in my experience to see uh, highways comments of, of the strength that we can see in this instance as well. Uh, as one who has perhaps been critical of highways officers over the years for perhaps underplaying the things perhaps in a way that I wouldn't have wanted. Uh, I mean, they're making quite strong comments here, I think. So that is weighing heavily with me. So I'm, uh, I'll listen to the rest of the debate. But that's kind of where I'm sitting at the moment on this, I think, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corcoran. Councillor Tuckle, you wanted to... Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up the point I made earlier on about there was um, a, a condition added previously that did look at noise and disturbance. And I'm just listening to the debate then about the amount of vehicles that we are be looking to be in this vicinity, um, that is going to cause possibly disturbance to, to neighbouring residents. Um, and I'd just be interested to hear what, what officers' um, view on that would be, whether that's an appropriate addition or not. Thank you. Who would like to say that? Ros, you want to say that? Yeah, I'll start and then Michael, please add anything that you wish to. So. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. It, it is an important point, and it's one that we thought um, quite carefully about. And as I mentioned, um, we actually took the opportunity to take some um, third-party um, consultant advice as well, because we wanted to be very thorough. Um, um, essentially, if we were looking to grant planning permission, we would um, be including conditions to control noise, certainly. Just trying to turn to the right page in here. Yeah, so there was, uh, there's a number of mitigation measures which we could consider and which we could um, impose through conditions. So uh, one of those that's been put forward, and I should say that these are um, measures that are put forward through the noise assessment submitted as part of the application. So closure of the car park between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., uh, prohibiting external public address, use of glazing and mechanical ventilation to avoid the need to open windows and also a facility use operations manual to control the use. So on page 84, um, officers have um, sort of considered those different um, proposed mitigation measures. Um, there are some sort of pluses and minuses to take into account. So for example, if you close the car park, um, evidently then people are going to have to park on the surrounding roads. So in effect, you displace that parking to, um, you know, to a different place. Uh, but officers have noted that that would mean that um, the access route to the, dwell um, to the property would be further away from, from residential neighbours. So on balance, we thought that that would be helpful. Um, and then one thing that officers gave um, a lot of thought to was in connection with um, the, the comments about mechanical ventilation. So we're obviously mindful that this is a listed building. Um, we need to be careful about um, you know, fixtures and fittings and, and causing harm to the special characteristics of the building. Um, but after further discussion with our noise officer, um, we're content that actually you don't necessarily need that mechanical ventilation. You could um, achieve an acceptable noise environment just through closure of the window. So we felt confident that um, we could, in effect, sort of condition um, noise as an issue. Um, but if, if we were to grant it and if um, the applicant wanted to open the windows, um, they could then look at, you know, a set for a separate process of um, applying for mechanical ventilation if that was um, appropriate and that would be looked at separately. But essentially, um, after that sort of careful consideration, we were content that conditions could address it. So I wouldn't recommend that you add this as an additional reason for refusal. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Chuckle. Can I have a follow-up? 
assume. To use Councillor Cornthorne's expression, can you <laughs> indulge me? <laughs> in Go ahead. Um, the other point I wanted to pick up was the access gates, which I think said was 3.2 metres. Um, and, and the report actually says it's, it's not wide enough for two vehicles to park, let alone if there was any emergency vehicles, larger emergency vehicles to get in. But just one, is, is, that, is that issue covered off in the condition around highways? The refusal, the refusal reasons. The refusal, sorry, the refusal reasons. Uh, uh, yes, it's in included for, as part of the refusal for safety grounds that two cars couldn't park. And if there was conflict, you could end up having a vehicle reversing onto the highway, which is against the highway code. Okay, that was the question. Yes. Just, got to, just to wrap up from, from my perspective, please, if please I can, go ahead. please. Um, thank you. Just for me, I, I think everybody in this chamber would, would, would welcome the police station to be brought back into use in, in some form. We've, we've seen examples elsewhere in the borough where heritage buildings fall into disrepair and nobody in this chamber would want that, I think. I think the, the, the trouble I'm struggling with on this application is we've got a perfect st highway storm brewing. We've got um, up to 60 car movements arriving. We've got a very, very sort of busy junction as we saw and we've heard about earlier on today. We've got an unofficial drop-off points um, which we can't manage and that could be left to the to the to the unenforceable whim of, of, of the of the car users at the time. We've got a very busy supermarket opposite um, and I know we, we heard that they have limited deliveries and, and collections but there's still large goods vehicles users of the supermarket, users to this potential facility on a very tight junction, and you've got school down the road as well. So we've got sort of a perfect storm brewing, and, and for me, wrapped in all of that, we haven't got a legal agreement to work with to mitigate the air quality impact. So I think for me on that basis, I would be happy to move officer's recommendation to refuse this item. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Tuckwell. Well, I have a second that. Councillor Gravio? Oh, sorry, Councillor Cawthorn. I don't mind which one. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I want to comment at the same time. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I endorse all that Councillor Tuckwell has said, with a heavy heart, actually, because clearly I, I think the intent behind what's come forward here is, is worthy, it's laudable, but, you know, we have to look at all applications without fear or favour based on planning policy considerations, uh, whoever the applicant is, quite frankly. So, to me, it just doesn't stand up. We, you know, we wouldn't want to limit numbers attending a place of worship. I mean, there are plenty of other places of worship. We'd be delighted to have uh, large numbers. You, know, you want to have a place where numbers can go in an unlimited way, and it just doesn't work at this location, in my opinion. Therefore, I w I'm happy to second the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee, I have been proposed and seconded. Another show of hands. Oh, did, sorry, Councillor Savori, do you want to yes. second? I just want to say that I have full sympathy with the community but we only can see the planning issues there, so it is very, very difficult to support this application. Well said, well said. Um, yes, yeah, so, and Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I read the report also. We had good discussion about that. Um, like, uh, I agree with we need the place for the worship. My concern is health and safety, like uh, Councillor Gold, she mentioned that the pick-up and drop-off for the elderly and children. So I support the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have a really good committee. We've had a good debate there. So uh, we are proposing the sector. Can I have a show of hands, those in favour of officer's recommendation for refusal? So Liz, that is unanimous. Thank you. Now we move on to the second part of this application, which is item seven, which is uh, the um, listed building consent. And that is also you, Michael, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so, item seven. Um, specifically relates to the listed building consent application, which, see, which seeks permission for internal alterations and repairs, including reinstatement and repair uh, works the windows, doors, the police lamp, and the police call box. So the police lamp can be seen on the left image. It's currently being stored internally within the former Norfolk Police Station building. The right image shows where the police lamp was previously located. 
and the proposal would reinstate the police lamp to its original location. Uh, so the police call box is also being stored internally as shown in the left image. The right image again shows where the police call box was previously located and the proposal would reinstate this feature to its original location as well. So this slide shows the proposed ground floor plan and comprises three rooms, a reception, kitchen, water closet, general storage and bike storage. This plan uh, details the proposed internal alterations including removal of partition walls, joinery alongside the stripping out of servicing, ceiling, floor and walls. A lift would be installed and partition walls would be installed to create sanitary and service rooms. The mechanical um, and electrical services would also be replaced. So this shows um, the proposed first floor plan, which again shows the same type of works, including the installation of partition walls and a lift. This floor would facilitate two rooms, three offices, and two water closets. And this slide shows the proposed second floor plan, which, which would facilitate two rooms, a kitchenette, a water closet, and a water closet, sorry. Um, further partition walls would be installed. Uh, this shows the proposed front and rear elevation and the uh, proposed size elevations. So the window and door schedule submitted um, as part of the application confirms that some windows would be replaced and that many of the doors would either be retained and made good or replaced with Edwardian style four panel doors. Um, the council's conservation officer has considered the detail of the application and confirm that the removal of historic fabric would result in less than substantial harm to the significance of the heritage asset. Uh, paragraph 202 of the National Planning Policy Framework states that where development leads to less than substantial harm, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits. The removal of inappropriate and modern alterations, reinstatement of joinery to reflect the original period of building, and general repairs would provide heritage benefits. The change of use of the building to a community and religious use would realize a public benefit However, the full planning application is not considered to be acceptable in all other respects and has been recommended for refusal. Um, it follows that the public benefit would not be realised and the heritage benefits would not be sufficient on their own to outweigh the harm posed. For the reasons outlined within the report, the listed building consent application is recommended for refusal. I pass back to you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, we have received another petition from... Uh, Mr. Zayman and Mr. Young, you have five minutes. Uh, I believe, believe you're sharing those five minutes. We don't want to go over what we've discussed before, so this is really about the consent, yeah? List of building consent, so up you go. Yeah, all, all points taken, uh, Chair, thank you. Um, I will focus very much on the list of building matters. Uh, Chairman, members, I wish to take very little of your time on this uh, matter, but six points to uh, point out. First, the internal condition of the building that my client inherits is amongst the worst I've seen in 20 years of planning. It has been chopped and carved and corrupted by the Met with very little regard to its architectural or historic significance. Second, this application for listed building consent relates only to the minimal internal alterations needed to operate for the intended use. Third, my client proposes to fully refurbish the building but as a charity, this only becomes possible with certainty regarding the use as a community centre. Obviously, that's just been dealt with. Fourth, your specialist officer has identified some minor harms to the building, and we agree between us that these are in the less than substantial category. Fifth, your officers are also satisfied that there are sufficient public benefits to outweigh this harm, and we very much support this view. But of course, this application only fails now because the earlier resolution means that the public benefits cannot be currently realised. But the proposals for this list of building consent application are otherwise acceptable. And if members agree, we would like the um, minutes to record that fact that you know, it, it, was, it was only because of the earlier refusal that this refusal occurred as well. Um, I believe Mr. Zaman has a couple of comments to make as well. Uh, thank you, Chairman, members. We know that taking on a listed building comes with significant responsibilities and it's not for the faint-hearted. We therefore, right at the outset, took early planning, architectural and heritage advice and have substantially altered our proposals as a result. For example, rather than creating a single open air for prayer and assembly, we've found ways to split our congregation into smaller units, staggering events and using technology to link rooms, our willingness to compromise. 
We've also taken on board your officer's suggestions. Internal alterations have been substantially minimized and our focus is to preserve the building's fabric and features of interest. No external alterations are proposed. Officers have also guided us in relation to important external features and we've agreed to refurbish and reinstall the lamp call box removed by the police. We've asked Rupert Harris Limited, conservators, conservators of the Royal Collection to carry out this work once planning permission is granted. We're acutely aware of our responsibilities as freeholders of a listed building and while we continue to protect and secure the premises, efforts to reverse the damage and dilapidation caused by the Met enhance the building for the public's benefit is contingent clearly upon planning permission for a community centre. We look forward to working with your officers to achieve this promptly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does any have any questions for the council? Do you have any questions for the position? No? Okay, thank you. So we'll go straight to the debate. Council Tuckwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I, again, um, I, I think this, this building and the, the, the heritage ashes that it is and listening to what the, the plans are, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it does look good, but it, it is linked to the previous application. Um, so uh, I don't think there's much more to add um, other than I would be happy to move officer's recommendation. Thank you, thank you very much. I have a mover, do I have a second? Councillor Gohan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, based on what Councillor Tuckwell just said, I'd be happy to second the officer's recommendation. Okay, committee, we have a proposal and a seconder. Can I have a show of hands of those in favour of officer's recommendation for refusal? Okay, that's unanimous. Those two, that's been refused. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll give everybody a couple of minutes to leave the room before we go to the next item. Those who wish to st stay for the next item, more than welcome. But. Um, And just another thing, can you not congregate outside? We have a committee to still go through. Sorry, can we, can we move along quickly, please? Mm, yeah. You can't address me now, I'm afraid. You can...
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Can I bring the committee back to order, please? Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Right. Okay, so we're going to the next item, which is item eight, which is... Ooh, oh, that's... Sorry about that. Which is Torbay Road 27 Dean Road Northward. Who is Anisha? Nisha? Sorry, I should have remembered that. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Nisha, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Item 8, Tormi 27 Dean Road, Northwood. The application proposes the demolition of existing buildings and replacement with up to a two and a half storey extension to the main building to provide four self contained flats and redevelopment of the existing coach house building to provide one masonet uni unit with associated parking, cycle and bin storage and landscape works. The proposal would provide four three-bedroom units and one two-bedroom unit. The proposed house admits is considered acceptable and would widen the choice of family size housing within the borough. The scheme is being presented to members following extensive pre-app advice with the council's planning department. Here is the location plan. The application site relates to a generously sized plot situated on the southern side of Dean Road. It comprises a large detached locally listed building which has been subdivided into seven flats. Here is an aerial view of the site for context. As can be seen from the constraints plan, the site is designated within the Dean Road Northwood area of special local character. Here is the front elevation of the locally listed building. This is the southwest view from Dean Road facing towards the application site. To my left is the front elevation of the locally listed building seen from Dean Road. To my right is the entrance to the site. Um, and then you can see the Muse complex in the background. This is the front elevation of the main property and the Muse complex. Uh, so to my left is the two-storey cottage. The front elevation of this building is being retained as part of the development. To my right are the garages. These are going to be demolished, um, but as stated within the committee report, it's considered that the loss of these garages is acceptable because it would have a minimal impact on the locally listed building. This slide shows the rear elevation of the building. The arrow points to where the proposed two and a half storey extension is going to be located. This photo is of the rear and side east elevation of the building, um, if I just point. So here is where the proposed cycle store would be located. Um, so this is the existing front and rear elevations of the building existing side and east and west elevations, um, lower ground floor plan, ground floor plan, first floor plan, loft plan, roof plan. Um, I'm just going to talk you through the consultation process and then I'm going to show you the proposed drawings and spend some time talking through the design changes that have been made to the scheme. So in terms of consultation, six objections, a petition against the application with 102 signatories and objections from Northwood Residents Association and Dean Road Residents Association were received. Also, an objection was received from a ward councillor. The primary concerns raised by the representations received relate to harm to the locally listed building, loss of trees, impact on neighbouring residential amenity, and parking and traffic implications. Please refer to section six of the committee report for the consultation responses and planning officers responses to those comments. So this is the proposed site plan. Um, so the footprint covered in blue shows where the proposed development would be located. So this is the cottage that I showed you in earlier photos. As previously mentioned, the front elevation of that building is going to be retained. This is where the proposed extension is going to be. There's going to be a glass link here, and that's where the cycle store um, is going to be located. So there's a lot of detail on these elevations, so I'll try my best to talk you through what's on the slide. So this is the existing locally listed building here. 
this element here is the glazed link and then this is the cottage the two-story cottage building that i referred to earlier and then this element here which you can see is where the proposed extension is going and then if you look at the bottom elevation which shows the rear so again you have the proposed dormers so this building already has a dormer but as part of the scheme additional dormers are being proposed in the rear elevation this is the two and a half story proposed extension this element here is the glass link um, so I'm just going to talk a bit more about the glass link um, so the detailing of the glass link would provide a clear distinction between the original and proposed built forms. This design approach was supported by the council's conservation officer at pre-application stage because it makes it easier to read the history of the building. And then I'll just move on to, this is the proposed side east elevation. Um, this is the proposed side west elevation. And then we have sections here. Having regard to the siting, scale, height, massing and design, it is considered that the proposed development would not cause harm to the character appearance of the area and would sustain the significance of the non-designated heritage assets in respect to the locally listed building at the site and the setting of the Dean Road area of special local character. Subject to condition 13 within the committee report, which requires the proposed side first floor windows in the rest elevation, I'll just point to them here, to be obscure glaze and non-opening up to 1.8 metres um, non-opening, it's considered that the proposal would not cause harm to the amenities of neighbouring residents. So this is the proposed lower basement ground floor plan. Um, so this is where the extensions go in here. Um, so this is flat A, which is a three bedroom unit. Um, this is the ground floor plan, so you have flats B and C. Flat C is a masonette, so this is the first ground level of the proposed flat here. Okay, and then you've got the first floor plan. This is the first floor level of flat C, and then you have flat D here. This is the loft floor plan, um, and then you have flat E here. Um, and this is just the roof plan. Um, so in terms of the quality of accommodation being proposed, um, so the all of the proposed flats would exceed the minimum plans London, sorry, the London plans minimum space standards, which is welcomed by offices. Um, the units won't meet the private amenity space required by the local plan. However, there is substantial community space on the site at present, and the future occupiers of the flats would have access to those communal grounds. So it's considered that the external amenity space provision, whilst not private, would be sufficient to meet the needs of the proposed development. So um, these are just elevations of the bins and cycle stores. Uh, to the front of the site, there's going to be proposed front boundary treatment in the form of a brick wall. Um, full details of the height of the brick wall will be conditioned. Um, just to note that the council's high rise officer has requested for um, the height of the wall to be reduced near the entrance points, and that's just to ensure that appropriate visibility space are achieved. Um, officers are satisfied that that could be fully addressed through the impositions of the recommended conditions noted within the committee report. Um, these are um, samples of the external finishes of the extension. Again, full details, including product specifications, would be secured for the external finishes and materials of the proposed development. I'm just going to go back to the ground floor plan to talk about parking because that was one of the concerns raised by uh, peti petitioners and the objections that have been received. So if you just give me a moment. Um, we need the ground floor plan. So the proposal would provide 16 car parking spaces in total. Nine of these spaces would be for the future occupiers of the proposed flat and the remaining seven spaces would be be for the occupiers of the existing seven flats at the site. 
it is acknowledged that the proposed nine new car parking spaces for future occupants would exceed the London Plan's maximum standard of five car parking spaces for development of this size. However, the Council's High Race Officer has commented that the over-provision of on-site car parking spaces is acceptable because it would reduce the potential for untoward on-street parking displacement due to the low PTAL rating of the site. Also, due rate has been given to the proposed housing mix, which would include four three-bedroom family-sized flats where a higher level of on-site car parking could reasonably be expected. As stated in the addendum circulated to members, the proposal would reduce the number of existing car parking spaces at the site from eight to seven, so it will be one parking space per existing flat. However, this reduction in car parking spaces um, would continue to exceed the London Plan's maximum requirement of 5.5 car parking spaces. The displacement of one existing car parking space is therefore unlikely to give rise to a significant increase in street parking pressure and would not warrant a ground floor refusal on this basis. The Council's Tree and Landscape Officer has raised no objection to the loss of the 19C and new category trees given their limited health and visual amenity value. It should be noted that all six of the category B trees would be retained as part of the proposed development. A condition would be secured requiring the construction works to be carried out in accordance with the tree protection measures specified in the agricultural method statement and tree protection plan. An indicative landscaping scheme has been submitted showing that the position of four replacement trees and details of hard surfacing and soft landscaping in event of an approval four landscaping details including boundary treatment and visibility displays would be secured by condition nine. Based on the information submitted in the Basement Impact Assessment and Surface Water Management Report, it is considered that the proposed development, including the basement level, would not increase the risk of flooding at the site or elsewhere. It is therefore recommended that planning permission is granted, subject to the imposition of relevant planning conditions. Um, I'll now defer to Katie Crosby, um, the team leader, who will be discussing the amendments to the wordings of conditions four, five, six, and seven. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Um, I just wanted to draw members' attention to an addendum note that's been distributed. Um, since the publication of the committee and addendum reports, it's been agreed with the agent to amend the four conditions that Nisha stated. Uh, the amendment for all these conditions, it alters the time trigger for when the details are to be submitted. So this would enable site clearance and demolition to be carried out before the submission and approval of an updated basement impact assessment, a scheme for sustainable water management, a sustainability and energy statement, and details of external surface materials. So these details would still need to be submitted and approved prior to construction, which is acceptable. Um, in terms of condition six, which is the sustainability and energy statement, we've also amended the wording of this to balance heritage preservation with the practicalities of achieving energy efficiencies. And this is also because these are extensions to and partial refurbishment of a locally listed building. The revised wording requires the development to make the fullest contribution to minimizing carbon dioxide emissions as far as practicable. So this is in line with the intent of local plan policy DMEI2 and is also considered acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. All done? Yes? <laughs> Good. Right. Um, we have a petitioner, uh, Mr. Par Perez, is it Perez? Pears, I beg your pardon. Um, whenever you're ready, you have your five minutes. I know you were here before, so I saw you. So you know the rules. You know the rules. It said you got four minutes green, one amber, and red, I'll stop you. Okay? My name is Michael Pears. I live in Dean Road, Northwood, and I speak for 92 of the 104 who have petitioned against this planning application. So why are the residents of Dean Road so up in arms that 104 have petitioned against this further overdevelopment in the Dean Road area, area of local, special local character? The special local characteristics are described in the Heritage Report as detached houses set back from the street by large gardens, trees and planting with verdant appearance throughout, and mature trees in profusion. So this 
ASLC is not about buildings, it's about the front gardens, the trees, the shrubs, and other green features of quality. You could say it's conserving leafy northward. The front garden of Tormead has trees in perfusion, and the building shelters behind a high hedge with a verdant front garden. The plan for North Tormead, a locally listed building, is to cut down the three metre high hedge, fell 13 trees in the front, and enlarge the six space car park, turning the verdant front garden into a six, 16 bay tarmac car park. You can see the result in the hard landscaping proposal that I sent uh, in advance. The building site next door to Tormead, at number 25, is currently an ecological disaster zone. And the local residents were amazed that permission was given to site a 13-bay concrete block car park in the front garden. The residents don't want to, say, to make to see the same mistake repeated at Tormead. The result of the two will be hard standing for 29 parked cars, right in the middle of the area of special local character. In the Hillingdon Local Plan Part 2 under Heritage HE1, 5 stop 17, it states that the council wishes to conserve areas of lo special local character. Hard standing for 29 cars will do the reverse and will destroy the green nature of the ASLC. Furthermore, in HE1, the Strategic Objectives SO8 states, protect and advance and enhance biodiversity to support the necessary changes to, adopt to, cli to adapt to climate change, where possible to encourage the development of wildlife corridors. Dean Road is already such a wildlife corridor. It has foxes, badgers, and deer. On a summer's evening, bats fly at dusk between the trees. Birds are in abundance, but it needs your protection. There is a simple solution, which would allow the provision of new flats with parking at Tormead without affecting the front garden. Simply put the 10 new car park spaces in the basement as an underground car park. In this way, the current small car park surrounded by its trees and garden can be retained in its original state, and the development might then comply with Hillingdon policy on areas of special local character. Although, frankly, DMHBH B5, sorry, which I'm sure you know well, uh, doesn't really cater for green space ACSLs. So what the petitioners would like the committee to consider, if they do give outline planning permission for four flats, flats, is to make it subject to the imposition of a condition that room for the 10 new car park spaces is provided in the basement. Climate change and the need to protect our envir environment emphasizes the need to keep our trees, plants, and green gardens, especially where, our, where they are the signature feature of our area of special local character. 104 local residents hope that you will be putting local residents first. And thank you for listening to them. Thank you very much, Mr. Pearce. Okay, does any councillors have any questions for Mr. Pearce? No? No? Thank you very much. Um, we have the applicant and agent, Mr. Westcott. Whenever you're ready, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> Chair members, thank you for allowing me to speak and support the planning application concerning five new homes at Tormead 27 Dean Road, Northwood. I am Mark Westcott, a director at HE8 Consulting and the planning agent representing Mr. Paul Sander, the applicant. Mr. Sander is the owner and a, a resident in the main building, which is known as Tormead. Tormead comprises seven self-contained flats, a separate coach house referred to as a, a cottage by the case officer, um, accommodates a single flat with um, garages at uh, ground floor, and a small collection of outbuildings providing domestic storage for Mr. Sander, Sander 
uh, are located next to Tormead on the western boundary. The proposal seeks to replace the outbuildings and the coach house, albeit retaining the coach house's front, uh, front facade, with an extension building to deliver four three-bed units and one two-bed flat. Therefore, a net gain of four homes will be achieved. The proposal has been developed through several pre-app meetings with the Council since June 2018. Notably, this included extensive consultation with a conservation officer. It takes account of officers' feedback, with particular reference to the building's relationship with the area of special landscape character, the locally listed status of Tormead, and the architectural merits of the coach house. This has resulted in a heritage-led and sympathetically designed scheme which is helped by a strong landscaping regime and no loss of good quality trees. Um, in response to the objector's comments on verdancy, verdancy will very much be maintained. In, importantly, no harm will be caused on the character and appearance of the area, whilst the significance of Tormead's local listing will be sustained. Other notable benefits of the scheme are making effective use of underutilised small previously developed sites of which the principle of residential development is well established. A positive contribution towards the borough's housing targets and choice, including the provision of four family-sized homes, a bill that maintains the architectural style of Tormead, no adverse impact on neighbouring amenity, a high quality standard of accommodation and an abundance of attractive amenity space and sufficient on-site parking, which will be served by electric vehicle charging points. Mr. Sander and I are aware of, of the neighbours' concerns regarding overdevelopment and the impact on Tormead's locally listed um, status. In response to the overdevelopment concern, the extent of the extension's footprint will be comparable to that of the current footprint made up by the coach house and outbuildings. It will not encroach significantly on the wider site, nor will its mass on the surrounding area. It represents a modest and subservient addition to Tormead that will provide a valuable contribution, no matter how modest, of much needed family homes in the borough. The scheme will be low in density and space standards, whether they be floor space or parking provision, will be exceeded. This wouldn't be the case if overdevelopment was a valid issue. With regards to the impact on, Tor on Tormead's listing, as I, I have said, the proposal will sustain its significance and this has been supported by your officers. The applicant is willing to accept planning conditions. These include conditions relating to the management of construction and the removal of permitted development rights for additional windows or doors um, and the inclusion of obscure windows on the, um, the side flank as indicated by the case officer, all of which serve to account for the neighbouring amenity. So to conclude, Mr Sander and I see no reason why the planning application should be refused and therefore respectfully ask members to grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Westcott. Does any of the committee have any questions? Mr. Westcott, Councillor Tucker. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for taking us um, through that. I mean, you, ma you made a statement in the, in the middle of your piece there, which was that, that verdancy would be maintained. I just wondered if you could just share your thoughts as to how that would be achieved for the rest of the committee. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Um, sorry, Nisha, I don't suppose we've got the landscape plans here. <laughs> I do apologise. Um, I don't have the landscape plan. It is an indicative drawing, so it wasn't included as part of the approved drawings on the conditions. Um, instead, a condition has been secured requiring a very detailed um, landscape and plan providing full details in terms of the boundary treatment. Um, sorry. Uh, you, yeah. Sure, but if, if I may answer um, yeah, the council's question. question, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, how has verdancy been maintained? Well, it's, it's by the, the proposed landscaping plan. Um, yes, there will be a loss of trees. Um, we're not hiding from the fact there'll be 19 um, unclassified or category C trees, which are regarded as poor in quality, and they will be replaced um, by compensatory trees and also an abundance of planting. And um, I was, would have referred to the indicative landscape plan as indicated by Nisha that that will be conditioned with regards to its detail. Thank you. Can you tell me how many trees that will be? How many trees are you yeah, removing? 19 um, cat U and C to yeah, be yeah. removed, four to be um, replaced, but that could increase yeah. under the detailed condition. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. We'll go then to the committee. 
there's no oh council sorry can, no there's no council present for that there was uh, he he wrote in as an objection there was not actually a petition to be prepared so thank you for reminding me but I didn't think I was going that much um, yeah council tablet yeah thank you Mr Chairman um, I've got mixed views over this uh, application um, I, I welcome the additional um, family dwellings because we we do need those um, four three bedroom flats is, is to be to be welcomed um, and I can see from the designs it's quite a high quality um, design as well but the thing that that makes me worry a little bit is the impact on the area of special local character I mean we saw the images of what it looks like at the moment um, and I, I just want to sort of get a, a feel from officers as to how what is the impact on the criteria required for you know for approving this on the area of special local character because you know this this is this is quite a dramatic change to to to, to Dean Road uh, and I just want to try and get a sense from officers as to how we've sort of been able to ensure that what is being planned actually meets the criteria that fits in with the area of special local character so uh, whoever wants to pick that one up Nisha do you want to take that Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair, sorry, not Chair, Councillor Tuckwell. Yes, so during the pre-out stage, the, um, extensive negotiations occurred uh, with the previous planning officers, myself who took on the case at a later stage, and also the former conservation area. So I'm going to pick up on some of the key design ch changes that were made in order to reach the position that we're now in where officers feel so this scheme is acceptable and would not cause harm to the setting of the Dean Road area special local character. So just give me a moment, find the correct plan. That's I'm just going to go to the proposed elevations. Hopefully these will pick up the points. So in terms of design, one of the important key characteristics is that the retention of this cottage or coach house here. So, and that is considered to be an integral part of this scheme. And then the proposed extension would be set behind it. And if you note the ridge line of the proposed extension, it's been carefully designed to mediate between the lower ridge height of the coach house and then the higher height of the main building. And that's intentional because we want the main building to remain the key feature when viewed from Dean Road. Um, so officers are satisfied that the proposed extension will achieve a um, appropriate degree of subordination uh, between the main building whilst ensuring that the coach house or the front facade of it is retained as well as part of the characteristics. In terms of the verdant character of the area, well, the proposed extension is going to be set behind the assisting front building line of the coach house. So that would help reduce or minimize its appearance when viewed from the streets in and also the height of the proposed extension as, as well helps to make sure that it doesn't appear as a prominent feature when viewed from Dean Road. Um, in terms of design changes that were made, um, on the rear elevation um, the dormers have been reduced um, so that was something that was negotiated and the applicant came back with a revised scheme showing reduction to the size of the dormers um, and also there were talks about the the glass link and that's considered to be an integral part of the scheme um, and as mentioned during the presentation it was something that was very supported by the council's conservation officer at the time um, is, have I answered your points is there something I've missed if, if I may come back mr. chairman you may no, you thank may. you no, thank you for taking me through that. that was really helpful I just wondered if you could just uh, for my benefit just give me a, a feel for where the parking sits in the uh, in the overall plan, just to sort of so I can get a feel in its relationship to to Dean Road. Sorry, it might be useful if I first show you the existing ground floor plan with the car parking arrangement, and then show you the proposed, so you can see the difference. So just give me a moment. I'll go back to the existing ground floor plan. Okay, so at present there's eight existing car parking spaces and the area is already tarmacked. Um, so th th this area here is used as car parking, it's tarmacked at the moment. Um, so I'm now going to take you to the proposed ground floor plan. So 
um, sorry, the orientation is a bit different, but this is where the car parking is. Um, it's in the same place, but it's going to be extended to accommodate 16 car parking spaces. And I just wanted to clarify that because I know we heard earlier from the petitioner about um, a higher number of car parking spaces, but in fact, it's actually only 16 car parking spaces that's being proposed here. Um, so, and then in terms of landscaping um, and ensuring that the verdant character is protected, as part of the landscaping scheme, officers will be wanting to see soft landscaping at the front. Um, the indicative plan shows replacement trees also to the front and the side. Um, it will, if members were minded to approve this application and if the agent's agreement, then we could increase the number of replacement trees as well to make sure that the verdant character is indeed protected. Thank you. I, I, I just want to talk my, my comment on that point. That really helped us, so thank you for that. I think we've got existing parking, but it's well screened behind some very mature trees and hedges that are looking to be removed. Um, and we've got wider parking area, which is now going to be sort of semi-exposed. I think it's whether there's anything that needs to happen to that condition to really make sure that that you know, protects the verdancy of, of, of Dean Road, because it's, it, it, as we've seen from the images, it's, it's a beautiful street scene now, we wouldn't want to sort of replace it with a car park. So I that's just, I'll, I'll I hear what other members I have I totally to agree with yeah. you. The great minds think alike. I, I've got a few questions, but I'll let the committee go first. Councillor Cawthorn first. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair, would like Councillor Tuckwell, I'm, I find myself struggling with this a little bit. I mean, uh, with due respect to the case officer and all of these things as we're subjective even among town and country planning professionals as we well know it's a significant problem for the development in an area of special local character uh, obviously it's a locally listed building and I'm just I, what worries me when I look at this sort of application is I'm thinking I, I, I think I think elsewhere if, if we're letting this sort of thing go through I'm thinking well what does it mean for other uh, perhaps similar locations. I know it's a large site, and I know on that basis you can say, well, it works okay on, on the site, but it's, it's still t we're still taking a lot on board there. So it, that's a general observation. Um, I'm interested in the locally listed aspect. So uh, what planning protection, if any, does that afford to a, to a dwelling, uh, to a building? It, it, perhaps I can have an answer to that question. I've got another one as well. In terms of the planting that's being proposed, um, Clearly, it won't be like for like, but what will the extent of the maturity of the trees that are being planted be? Can we have a sense of that, please? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about this one, so I'm not sure, but I wouldn't mind answers to those questions, please. Thank you. Nisha, do you want to say that? Sure. Um, I'll tackle the last point first. So, in terms of the trees, well, we can word the condition where we ask for the species of the trees and also. Um, it it will be for the councils and tr tree and landscape officer um, with their guidance to advise us at detail superstituent stage as to whether the trees that the applicant's proposing is sufficient in order to protect the verdant character of the area. So we will have some control in that respect to ensure that the, the trees that are being proposed, the replacement trees, are of high quality. Um, and in terms of your first point, sorry, could you summarise what you said again? Yeah, uh, just about the status of locally listed buildings and wh uh, what planning protection exists around them or to what extent is there planning protection and, and how does that work with what's being proposed? Sure. Um, so the risk planning protection against it, as noted within uh, the local plan, um, if you refer to the committee report's impact on the character appearance section, it refers to the specific policies in terms of heritage assets. Um, I, because it's only locally listed building, it doesn't have the same rate as a graded, a statutory listed building. So I just want to clarify there is a distinction as to how much protection locally listed buildings are given. Um, but officers do feel that this scheme does indeed protect the heritage, the non-designated heritage asset of the locally listed building. Um, for the reasons I've mentioned about making sure that the proposed extension remains subservient, um, securing appropriate external finishes and detailing, um, and also being able to differentiate between the original building and the new extension, um, as mentioned through the proposed glazed link. Okay, before we uh, chance to call for that, 
I'd like Ros to add to that as well. Thank you, Chairman. It was just to add to what Nisha said, um, just regarding sort of the policy considerations for locally listed buildings. So on page 153 of your committee report, um, we've got policy DMHB3, um, which relates to locally listed buildings. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that, and obviously you can um, see that we've summarised the policy there, but also of importance um, in the MPPF, um, paragraph 203 is relevant, so this talks about um, how you deal with um, non-designated heritage, heritage assets, um, which is applicable in this case. So I'll just read it out. So the effect of an application on the significance of a non-designated heritage asset should be taken into account in determining the application. In weighing applications that directly or indirectly affect non-designated heritage assets, a balanced judgment will be required having regard to the scale of any harm or loss and the significance of the heritage asset. So you can see that it's not um, as high a bar as Nisha said um, if we were talking about um, you know, a statutory listed building um, or a formally designated um, conservation area. So this is um, the area of special local character is a non-designated heritage asset, as is the locally listed <coughs> building. Hopefully that helps. That's a cool point. A quick fo follow up on the Another matter, if I may. Go ahead. Um, on page 151, there's reference to the five-year land supply uh, situation uh, in the borough. And I just wonder to what extent that's a factor here. We're, we're not under, under any planning policy pressure in terms of not, not being there in terms of housing numbers. Can I, can I be just be clear on that? Are we, uh, uh, we're in a sound. We're not. We're not struggling with housing numbers and five-year land supply. There isn't that imperative behind this. No, I, I yeah. wouldn't have said that. But I mean, it's very rare that we do get three-bedroom applications. I don't know if officers want to come back on that. Yeah, I mean, I think my own assessment of this is actually quite a nice scheme. I think um, quite a lot of thought and effort has gone into it, and the applicant has worked hard. Um, gone through our pre-application process to arrive at a scheme that the conservation officer um, was content with. Um, as the chairman has noted, there are a number of family-sized units um, which we welcome. And you could see, uh, as Nisha has talked us through, they've they've tried to sort of work with um, the protecting the listed, the locally listed building in terms of incorporating that glazed link, which I think personally think is a successful feature. Any further? Oh, sorry. No. Sorry. Well, Thank you, you Chair. Counselor. Just to add to what Roz said there as well, I think you're correct, Councillor. Um, there is no pressure, or there isn't pressure at the moment on our five year housing supply. Of course, it is important that where you know, all other considerations are met, that we do continue to approve residential units, obviously, to ensure that we, that position doesn't change um, and the status of the development plan comes under pressure. So, um, you know, having regard to all other considerations here, um, yeah, uh, I think. Uh. Thank you, Noel. Councillor Gohill, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, uh, the first one is just surrounding um, uh, safety and uh, like transport safety, access for ambulances, etc. Is the space at the front of the house uh, big enough? And if the if the car park were full, um, with the maximum 16 proposed cars. Um, in the space, would it still be suitable for an ambulance or fire engine, et cetera, to get in and out? Um, for the second question, can we go back to the picture of the back garden, please? The uh, existing back garden, yeah, that, this one. Um, so uh, along the ground floor there, uh, from my understanding, there's still going to be flats along that ground floor, but in the earlier presentation, it was said that the garden would be a communal space, be it you know, used by all. I'm just slightly concerned about the privacy of those on the on the ground floor and uh, what can be done to mitigate that. And secondly, um, I'm not sure if the side picture will be better for this, but can you perhaps use the laser and point out exactly where that where the bike storage is going to go? Um, sorry, the side of the house. Um, if you could perhaps point that out. It seemed there was a dip, and the yeah, there we go. There's a dip. Where where would the the garage go exact? Where would the the parking, the car cycle parking rather, um, sure. space go and uh, if it's at the bottom, if they're going to be, how are people going to get sort of down there and up there, it doesn't seem like it was thought out and finally very quickly um, finally very quickly uh, where are the uh, bins or uh, bins going to be 
um, or bin storage, wheelie bins going to be stored? Um, because the last thing we want is for a development like this to pop up and, you know, suddenly we see piles and piles of bin bags accumulating at the front. Fine. Who wants to go first? Nisha or Ross? Nisha? Sure. Um, I'll tackle some. Um, maybe Sophie can comment about the access arrangements for highways. Um, okay, so let's start with the basement. So I just want to point out that the basement level, the lower ground level, there's existing flats here already, and it outlooks onto the communal amenity space, so it will be a similar arrangement with the proposed development. Um, by having that relationship, uh, where the ground, because of the ground levels lowering as you move further into the site, it does ensure that the occupiers of the proposed basement level do receive sufficient outlook and natural light because that is a common problem when you're trying to introduce basement residential units where in this case due to the changes in ground levels having those windows um, if I go to the proposed rear elevation having the windows facing onto the communal amenity space does provide benefit in terms of the quality of internal amenity space that would be provided to the future occupiers of the basement level um, so this is the lower ground level um, I'll just show you. So these are the existing units that you saw in the photo, um, and this is where the proposed unit would be. They would have a terrace area, and then they'll have steps going down leading to the communal garden here. So that's how it would work, um, and officers feel quite comfortable that the future occupiers of this basement level would receive adequate outlook and light, um, and it would be a good standard of internal accommodation that would be provided. In terms of the cycle store, um, this plan shows that the cycle store would be sited here. Um, and again, it's due to the changes in the ground levels, so um, it, it naturally lowers. So anyone going to the cycle store would push their bike along, the ground levels would change. And they walk this way, there's a track here you can see, and just put their bike here. And then they could walk up the stairs without their bike because they've parked it or stored it in the bike store and they either go about their everyday chores or they go back to the flat. So that's how the cycle store arrangement would work. Um, in terms of the highway safety, Sophie, do you think you can pick up on that point? Um, yeah, uh, there is sufficient space um, within the proposed car park for an ambulance and fire truck to get in if all cars are, are parked in the spaces as long as they're parked properly, which I'm sure they would be, um, as a condition with the for parking allocation plan, um, and we can make sure um, that that's sufficient. But there is a, enough space proposed to um, get in unaided, unimpeded. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Can you turn your microphone off? Uh, it, it's my go. I don't usually get a go, but I will today. Um, Four trees, obviously, you're going to remove 19. I'd, I'd make sure that the balance is planted. Obviously, it can't be all planted on that site, but we'll have somewhere in Northwood. I'm sure we can find the balance of those trees. Um, if, that, if that could be done, I'll ask officers on that. Um, the tarmac on the parking, is that all going to be removed and then replaced with a porous uh, type of surface so that the water drains away? And also on the land, uh, wildlife, I... I I, I would like it if, obviously, if the committee allows, that the landscaping comes back to me as the chairman uh, to, to make sure that it is uh, correct, um, but that will be up to you to decide whether that's okay. So those questions, can they be answered by somebody? Thank you. Go on, Rob. Yeah, I'll take those. Okay, yeah, I mean, we can certainly make some amendments um, in terms of the landscaping condition. I've just got it in front of me here. Um, so as it's currently worded, um, it does specify that the planting scheme um, should include, sorry, I keep hitting that, uh, four replacement trees and hedging. So I think it would be prudent if members felt that, um, you know, greater number of trees um, would be suitable that we would amend that wording. Um, I, if members wanted to propose a particular number, um, you know, feel free to do that. Otherwise, we could talk about significant um, replanting, for example. Um, and I think it would be possible to incorporate in that that those details um, would be um, 
you know, obviously submit it to the local planning authority in consultation with the chairman, um, if that would be acceptable to you, chairman. And then the final point, if I've remembered them all, was regarding the, um, the parking area and the, um, the surfacing material. So I have the plan in front of me here, um, and it does refer to the existing drive and parking removed, and then it is annotated that it's permeable resin bonded gravel. So my understanding is that that is the proposed material. Now the condition that we're talking about, condition number nine, um, it does require the submission of the hard surfacing materials. Um, so we would have the opportunity to uh, review what's proposed and to um, ensure that that's acceptable. Um, and we could, if members felt it appropriate, add in some additional wording there to ensure that it was permeable. Um, we could say not tarmac. Um, that we want, or we could, if you're happy with the material that's shown on the drawing, we could specify um, that specifically. I don't think the committee would be onerous, but obviously if you're removing 19 trees, I think 19 trees would be replaced somewhere, somewhere northward, and obviously somewhere would be on that site. Also, the, well, the reason that I've asked committee's permission for it to come back to me, I just want to make sure that we do cater for the wildlife. Green Road has a lot of wildlife there, so some hedgerows and stuff, make, you know, and sort of oxygenating plants that are good for, for air quality would be really helpful. Um, it is one of those ones that's 50-50, uh, to be quite honest. Um, so, Councillor Tuckworth. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you for the, the additional points that have just come out of there. I mean, the scheme's very attractive to me with the addition of family homes. It, it, it looks and feels like a high-quality um, development good to see that we've got our brick tinting condition in there you know that's one of my favorites and I'm sure officers will be all over that to make sure that we don't have a mismatch um, should this be approved this evening I'm still uncomfortable with the um, the impact on, on Dean Road given the fact that um, you know a lovely set of trees there are going to be removed and the whole street scene is going to change um, that said um, you know it's heavily conditioned in, in other areas and I do, I do support, and I'm sure my colleagues on the committee would also support that the landscaping condition comes back to you, Mr Chairman, to act on our behalf. And I know, and I know the word mature trees send shivers down officers' spines because um, then they're very difficult to take and often don't survive. But we have done that in other schemes where we've looked at the mature tree issue rather than, you know, saplings so we can at least mitigate the impact on the, uh, on the street scene for Dean Road. Um, quicker than, than it would take if we was to plant sort of saplings. So I'm, I'm happy for it to come back to you, Mr Chairman, um, to act on our behalf, and on that basis, I'm happy to move officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Tuckwell. Ross, you want to come in before? Yeah, thank you. Um, there's obviously a number of points that have been raised um, and would require a number of tweaks to the condition. So I would suggest that if you are minded, um, to grant planning permission that you delegate for myself to go away and um, have a think about what you said and to propose um, rewording of the condition which I would um, ask the chairman to approve. Yeah, and, and I'd also look into the landscaping around the car park to see if that can be hidden in some way. I don't know. Yes, so, uh, any sort of second, Councillor Gohan? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I agree exactly with what, what Councillor Tuckwell said. I think... Um, Yes, it is going to change the, straight, the street scene of Dean Road, and it, it, it will unfortunately have an impact in that sense. But I think on balance, um, the creation of uh, dwellings that are suitable for family size, so sort of three-bedroom dwellings, kind of outweigh, outweigh the benefits of that. And I'm, I'd, per I'd be perfectly inclined to agree with, the, um, with uh, yourself, Ros, and um, you as well, Councillor. Higgins looking into the possibility of those extra trees being planted, extra shrubbery, etc. Um, and on that basis, I'm happy to second uh, officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you very much, Councillor Goyle. So we're proposed and seconded. Can I show hands and votes, please? Those in favour of this application, it's unanimous with those other extra conditions. So, please. Um, okay, so that one's done. Now, number nine, 107 Harefield Road, Fiona. Thank you, Chairman. Lovely. Sorry. I'll just get to the correct slides. Apologies. Oh, I'm going the wrong way now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. 
Right, thank you. Um, planning permission is sought at number 170 Harefield Road um, for a new three-bed bungalow at the front of the site. Now, members are likely to remember this scheme. Um, it came before you in July, um, where we recommended refusal, and that was agreed by members, and it was subsequently dismissed at appeal. It's quite a lot of content about that appeal decision within the report for you to consider. Um, but importantly, just turning to the site plan, you can see that there is a substantial setback um, at the front of this property, and there's a pair of properties further back. We've discussed before at the meeting about how the urban grain around here is quite varied. We have some backland development that's come over time, of which some of the detail is in the planning history section of the report. Turning to the constraints, it's in an area of parking management, but no other constraints of note. And then this image just gives you a closer location plan to show you the front of that site and that generous setback. Now the proposed site plan, um, I think it's important at this point to tell you how it differs from the appeal scheme that you saw previously. Um, the footprint has been reduced. Um, it's set in slightly from the eastern boundary. There's some design tweaks and changes to the fenestration. Um, the height has been reduced um, from 7.3 metres to 6.2 metres. The width has been marginally reduced and there's some additional landscaping proposed. Um, the concern for us is that it's still a substantial built structure um, and it's all relating to the loss of the openness to the front of that site and also the obscuring of those two properties behind which we've always said make a contribution to the street scene. Um, and the appeal decision, which is referred to on 183 of our report, talks about this dis degree of spacing, the fact that this site, in the context of others, whilst, whilst there's built form along there, it's unusually small, um, and there's a close relationship to the boundaries, and it's all those things that still remain in the scheme for us that detract from that spaciousness and doesn't overcome the reason for refusal. Um, it's just, I'll go through the floor plans quickly to show you the layout the design changes, and there's the elevations there. Similar in terms of character, appearance, and design, and there was no objection to that because of the um, history for the bungalow around the back. It's a similar proposal, but it's just that relationship. And here, this is a very um, helpful image that shows you those reductions I, I mentioned in red, um, and also shows our other concern relating to the second reason for refusal, the proximity to those rear windows. Um, now this, in, again, is covered by the inspector who agreed with us that whilst there is a level change, it doesn't go far enough. There are still views, direct views from first floor level to ground floor level and vice versa. And at 18 metres apart, that's just too close for us to support. It's a bird's eye view just to show you that varied urban grain I discussed earlier. These are the attractive two properties that are well set back, 170 and 172. And this is the um, boundary fencing we talk about in the, in the report that's been put up to the front of the site. You can see just a glimpse of that bungalow to the rear. That's the site itself. And this is the sort of access way that runs down the side. So this is the previous appeal scheme just to highlight the similarities in terms of position and plot size and also, again, highlight that relationship that we still think is unacceptable. That concludes my presentation, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiona. Um, we, this is the last petition item of the uh, Scott Warren, you know the rules. You've been here before, mate. When you, you just try it. Go on, have a go. Just reach one over. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Off you go. Yeah, it's just uh, on behalf of all the residents around the area um, in the immediate vicinity of the property, um, major concern um, for us is from the um, pathway, as you say on that, that first picture you was on with the, the gradient, if you're walking down the road on the path, you won't be able to see the two properties because the angle of attack of the building and it's six metres high, you won't actually see any of the property at all. So effectively, they're disappearing from the street scene. And as you say, that's one part of the massive part of that, not only that way, looking at the properties, but looking out. So you'll end up losing it. And obviously I've got photos to back up. Things like sunsets and things will just disappear completely um, just because of the, the gradient of the road and the way that the path goes down. Um, but also, I don't think it's probably not considered all the time is the properties across the road. Um, and if you look along the street scene, 
Um, you won't see that in that picture, but 217 and 215, they've actually been offset in their designs to stop them looking at each other as they go across the road when they were developed probably 30, 40 years ago. Um, these houses have been over 100 years, and, and it'd be disappointing that they had they would lose that view or the outlook. It's not the actual view, it's the outlook from the properties and the sun coming into the properties. Um, the neighbours in 172, 170A, uh, and 170B all share that driveway. So there's in excess now of seven vehicles a day uh, that can go up and down that driveway. Now what I haven't seen on the development of the plan is have they got rear access uh, and exit on the access road? Um, and obviously there'd be a concern for families and road safety because there is no way of seeing anything if they're coming down the road. Um, as you can see from 170, they can only pull in forwards and reverse out. So there is a blind bend for them. Um, there's also a telegraph pole that's being proposed to put up there because there's still no hardwire internet in the back property. Um, so I think all in all for me is it's just an overdevelopment for the actual area. The infrastructure is not quite there and you'll be housing in excess of 10 people where there was originally one family of, of four or five. And I think that it's just one step too far. I've had a quick look around the area and also other areas in London, and I've yet to find a, a you know, proposal in the front garden that would wipe out the view of the rear properties behind it. It just, it just doesn't seem to be approved. And I, you know, I'm happy for that because I just do think it would ruin the local area and then in keeping. So any questions I'd invite, but thank you. Thank you. Well, I wasn't going to make some comment about a TV show, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions to uh, the petitioner? No? Okay, fine, thank you. Uh, the agent. Jim Beek, yes, when you're ready. Uh, this committee has previously considered an application proposal to build on this site following an appeal made to the planning inspectorate for non-determination. Although the appeal was unsuccessful, the applicant has carefully listened to the inspector's comments and responded to them in detail through amendments to the new scheme. The inspector's analysis of the particular nature of the local context confirmed that he was satisfied that the sighting of the dwelling and its position in front of number 170 would not in itself be uncharacteristic or discordant. With regard to the claim of overdevelopment of the plot, he considered that there was little firm reason to conclude that the further subdivision of the site would inevitably be uncharacteristic or harmful to the appearance of the area. Limited separation from side and rear boundaries, however, would, in his view, caused the dwelling to appear somewhat cramped and squeezed onto the site. But the large setback of numbers 170 to 72 from Harefield Road reduces their prominence and their position would not be unduly conspicuous. While the sighting of the new dwelling would detract from the spacious quality of its surroundings and would obscure significant proportions of the number 170 to 72 pair, diminishing the contribution they make to the street scene, the inspector concluded on balance, the harm arising on this count would accordingly also be modest. Finally, the proposal w would result in some harm to the character and appearance of the area, although he considered the degree of harm would be modest. In response to the critical aspects of the inspector's analysis, the new proposal has been reduced in width, depth, and height to significantly reduce its impact in the local context. Separation distances to the east boundary has been increased to one and a half meters, to the rear boundary from 7.6 meters to vary between nine to 11 meters due to the new staggered rear elevation, and the height of the ridge has been reduced by one meter and the roof reconfigured to eliminate the east side gable. The building footprint has been reduced by 14% and its internal floor area would be 26% less than the last scheme. Taking, taken together, these alterations to the proposal represent material changes in scale and massing which warrant new assessment of the potential impact of the revised design, particularly given the only modest impact of the preceding scheme. Evidence has been provided showing that the proposed new dwelling would reinforce the consistent setbacks of neighboring dwellings along this stretch of Harrowfield Road and also the established tiered character of the context with dwellings stacked two or three deep from the street. With regard to the separation distance falling below the 21 meter standard, the inspector judged they would result in an impression of being overlooked and a loss of privacy for the neighboring occupiers. The amended design ensures that the lounge doors, the only rear-facing opening to a habitable room, would be set 21.4 meters away from the front of the attached garage to number 170. All other windows are set obliquely to this opening with views partially obscured by the kitchen projection. The inspector acknowledged the analysis the uh, appellant had provided of local precedents for reduced proximities and overlooking between properties, but considered that insufficient detail had been provided to properly assess these. 
photo photographic evidence was submitted with this application establishing that closer prox proximities have previously been considered acceptable, particularly between new consented dwellings and adjoining gardens. The relationships between adjoining amenity gardens and closely built up context invariably provide a degree of potential overlooking, which cannot be excluded but should be properly balanced. Planting, therefore, always provides an individual owner with the opportunity to enhance privacy and restrict potential overlooking. The planting already undertaken by the applicant was not intended to complete this project, but rather to highlight the potential which could be achieved. The amenity garden to the proposed dwelling has been increased in size by 27% and now provides 43 square meters more than the Hillingdon standard of 60 square meters, greatly enhancing opportunities for using landscaping to secure mutual privacy. There is also adequate space to the front of both numbers 170 and 72 to provide additional planting if desired by those owners. Together with the increased separation distance, the new proposal offers significant mitigations to meet the parameters of this site. Finally, assessment of the proposal should recognize that the site has been separated from number 170, Harrowfield Road, and no longer forms part of an existing front garden. Assessment of the development of this plot should therefore be considered in comparison to that as undeveloped land, not front garden land. The setbacks to neighbors to both sides are largely hard paved to provide car parking and driveways to other rear properties, and that is the likely destiny of this plot as well if no dwelling is developed. An offer has already been received from a neighbor to buy the plot to extend their parking and including erecting a garage, detached garage, as is the case at the existing number 168. Every objection to the previous scheme upheld by the planning inspector in his professional judgment has been addressed and the scheme amended accordingly. If the committee this evening should determine to refuse this new application, the applicant will consider it uh, the possibility to take the, the case to appeal for new assessment okay. of its merits. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions for the um, for, uh, for agent? No? Okay. So we'll go straight to the... Uh, so we've got a councillor. Councillor Bowles. How could I forget? Sorry. I do beg your pardon. You know you've only got three minutes. Though, I right? won't take that very long. That's fine. You go ahead. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I su fully support the petitioners on this. It's Harefield Road. We've seen every meeting seems to be dominated by proposals in Harefield Road. But this one, it's still a large unit being plonked in a front garden. And they just don't get it. It is going to be detrimental to the people living there, having it stuck in front of, in front of them. And uh, the petitioners care about the area. They care about the road, the, the, the layout. This is an overdevelopment for the area. So please reject it and support the petitioners. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Does anybody have any questions for Councillor Wells? Councillor Courtauld, how about that? There's a bit of a challenge going on here. There you go. Um, a question, really, for clarification. Um, we've just heard from the applicant, I believe, uh, that there seems to be a difference of view about the distance from the buildings. Uh, we're talking on page sorry, one. Sorry, Councillor Cawthorn, was that a question to Councillor Bowles? Or you actually... Uh, no, it wasn't. No, right, okay, I, fine. So, I'm sorry, so you, you got off the hook there lightly, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. Right, so I'll open it to the floor. Councillor Paul. Thank you very much. With apologies to Councillor Bell for putting him on the spot there. Um, the second paragraph of page 187 talks about distances being short of the 21 metres set out in the local plan. Uh, the applicant appears to have suggested that uh, it's, it's somewhat more than that, 21.4 metres. Are we talking about the same thing? And if we are, which is correct, please? Could I just have clarification? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's this distance here from this back wall, I'd use my pointer, and to this front wall of, the, of number 170. Now, we scale that distance at 18 metres. Um, and I think there may be a conflict with what the measurement on the drawing says, but we are scaling that as 18 metres between the properties. So we, we, because you would be approving, if it were to be approved, these plans, that's the distance we think we would be approving. Okay. Chancellor Cawthorn, is that fine? Yeah, sorry, can, can the agent turn your, can you turn your microphone off? Sorry, Michael. thank you. Uh, Councillor Tuckwell. 
Thank you, Mr Chairman. And uh, yeah, I certainly remember the July meeting. Um, and I think it's been said, it seems to be half of the road features every meeting now. But uh, well, I'll tease out the points I wanted to raise here. And in the previous application, we had four refusal reasons. This one's got two. Can I just get some clarification on the, the two uh, refusal reasons that have now been satisfied? My concern is, is that we'll be back next month with one refusal reason and the following month with none. So can we just have a sort of a, a bit of a feel as to sort of, you know, the journey that we're on on, on this application? Thank you. Fiona, there you go. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so there was two other reasons for refusal. One related to transport and highways, because they were concerned about the carriageway to the front of the site um, and the kind of in and out crossover that was being created. Um, the inspector did not agree with that assessment and wasn't concerned about it. Um, so raised no objection and didn't dismiss it on that point. So we've given due weight to the inspector's decision. We've taken that on board and no longer included it. The other one was related to the access um, and the level access created for accessibility reasons into the new property and concerns about whether they would meet the requirements. Um, but again, the inspector was happy, happy with that arrangement and we could condition it um, if the scheme were otherwise acceptable. So it's those two points of character and appearance and the openness as well as the impact on number 170 behind that remain. No, thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you. That's really useful because I think it's, it's, it's useful for anybody watching and people that are here tonight to sort of understand, you know, what, what third parties are making of this application in, uh, in His Majesty's Planning Inspectorate now. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll listen to any other comments and then maybe come back to something a bit later. Okay, does anybody have any chance to go here? So, thank you, Chairman. Um, I actually, uh, I know Councillor Tuckwell raised some um, uh, concerns about, you know, it coming back with less refusal of reasons, but that would actually be a good thing in this case, because honestly, I don't see a way, um, even with this new proposal, how it could, um, <coughs> how it could uh, continue to not be sort of, how it can continue to not be kind of uncharacteristic in the area or how it could continue to not result in a loss of privacy for its neighbours. I mean, hearing what the petitioner had to say specifically about, you know, kind of cutting him off from the street scene as well, it's, it's, it's exceptionally concerning. So um, if it's okay, I'd like to go ahead and propose that we go ahead with Otto's recommendation for refusal. Thank you, Gohil. Uh, Councillor Mann. Thank you. I mean, I echo the comments um, made by uh, my fellow councillors. Um, it's clear that the history it's had with its... Um, rejection, uh, those concerns are still very much there in terms of its size, position, bulk. And I feel that those are the, re the, the most important reasons for refusal is actually the uncharacteristic nature of the, or, or, or of the actual proposed building. So um, for me, the main reason for refusal still, still remain. Would you like to second it? Yeah, why not? Yeah, I'll second it. There you go, Councilman. That's your first seconding. So I'm proposing second. Those in favour of the officer's recommendation, please show of hands. That's for refusal. Thank you very much. That's been refused unanimously. Okay, so we go to the non-petition items, uh, which is item 10, former garage site rear of Sullivan Crescent Airfield. Anisha. Anisha, not Anisha, sorry. Beg your pardon. Sorry. I'm afraid not. Um, I'm led to believe that it was uh, it was advertised and, and out for clean. So we have to, I'm afraid, go with what's in front of us. So, no, no, no. What I'm trying to say is that when an application um, is put forward by, in this case, I think it's the council's application, it will have notified all the neighbouring properties and everybody around the area 
and what the intention was to do. That would have given you the opportunity then to petition the committee to then speak upon it. Yes, I'm, I'm sure they would have been, I'm sure, and all, all the organisations. Yeah, I pre I'm, really, I'm really sorry. I wish I can. I have a constitution and, and I can't really break that. So we'll have to just go forward. Glenn, can I'll just let like, e legal uh, come on this. Uh, Chairman, if the, if the procedure has been followed, then... Um, in fairness to all other applications, if, if, if you were to defer it on this occasion, you'd have to defer for every other occasion where petitioners, for whatever reason, have missed the deadline for, for filing a petition. The Council's responsibility when, ha when considering planning applications is to remain neutral. If we were to um, grant an extension on this time, you'd have to grant one on another occasion. So, Chairman, the procedure's been followed. I'd, I'd, agree, with you, I'd agree with what you've just said. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, we've got a list of who's been notified on our system anyway so it has definitely gone out okay thank you sorry that's something that i don't I really i don't know that and obviously we're, we're a planning committee so i have to adhere to that so sorry but i have to get on now thank you thank you very much right um nisha yeah you've got your name on it Thank you, Chair. Item 10, former garages site, Rear of Sullivan Crescent, Harefield. The application proposes the erection of four two-storey terrace houses and two two-storey semi-detached houses with associated car parking and landscaping works. The application is a resubmission following the lapse of granted planning permission reference ending in 2011-907 for the erection of four dwellings. This application is being presented at the Borough Planning Committee because the applicant is the Council's Capital Programmes Work Services Department. Here is the location plan. Here is an aerial image of the site. The site mainly comprises hard standing, but there is a patch of grass space adjacent to numbers 42 slash 44 Sullivan Crescent, which forms part of the curtilage of the application site. The red line boundary shown here should have included part of this grass area because that forms part of the curtilage of the application site. Policy DMH6, um, Garden and Backland Development of the Hillingdon Local Plan Part 2, has been applied to this application due to the site containing a section of grass space. Having regard to the criteria of Policy DMH6, in giving rate to the previously granted planning permission, it is considered that the principle of erecting dwellings on the site is susceptible. Here is the constraints plan. The application site does not fall within any local designation local plan designations. However, behind the application site is Metropolitan Greenbelt. Here is the entrance to the site from Sullivan Crescent. So I'll just point, so that's this point is this road or this track here. And then at the moment there's um, lot metal gates. Um, this is a view from within the site facing northwest towards numbers 42 and 44 Sullivan Crescent. View uh, facing north towards numbers 191-193 and 187-189 Ashgrove. Um, and view facing rest towards numbers 34-40 Sullivan Crescent. Here is the proposed site plan. The four proposed terrace houses are located on plots 1 to 4, which are these plots here. The proposed end of terrace houses on plots 1, which is this one, and plots 4 on this one are four bedroom units and the mid terrace houses are three bedroom units. The semi detached houses being proposed on plots five and six are three bedroom units. The proposed development would provide 12 car parking spaces in total, i.e. two spaces per trailing. This provision would marginally exceed the London plan's car parking standards. However, um, this over provision was considered acceptable by the council's highways authority um, as it reduces the untoward parking displacement within and outside the site envelope due to the PTEL, the very poor PTEL rating of the site and the absence of any on street parking controls. Okay. All six of the proposed houses would exceed the London plan's minimum internal space standards based on offices calculations. Sorry, I'll just go back to this plan. Based on offices calculations, um, the proposed houses 
on plots four and five would fall marginally below the external amenity space standards required by the London um, by the local plan. Um, so the house on plot four um, has a rear garden measuring 94 square meters, so it would fall below um, the required 100 square meters by six square meters, and then the house on plots five would measure 55 square meters with a, four, a shortfall of five square meters. Um, all the other remaining proposed dwellings would meet the external amenity space standards. Um, in terms of having the on-balance assessment due to the failure to comply with the external amenity space standards for plots four and five, uh, consideration has been given to the proximity of the site to the local children's playground and park, which is here. Um, so bearing that in mind, it's considered on balance that an acceptable provision of open space would be afforded to the future occupiers of the proposed development. Um, here are the proposed elevations of the dwellings on plots one to four. Sorry, I know it's like title one to five, but it's one to four. Um, this is a street scene elevation. So I'm just going to talk you through the changes that were made during this application stage. So to ensure that it respects the street scene, the ridge height of the proposed dwellings and the eaves height were reduced to match the existing properties at numbers 42 and 44 Sullivan Crescent, uh, which is these properties here. Um, and then you also have the side gable roof profile, which is a characteristic feature on Sullivan Crescent, which has been incorporated as part of this scheme. Here are the proposed floor plans for plots one to four. Um, on ground floor level, you have an open plan kitchen, dining, living room, and on first and within the loft floor space, um, you have bedrooms. Um, so these are the proposed dwellings on plots five and six. So it's these houses here. Um, I would like to draw members' attention to the angled windows which were negotiated as part of the planning application process. So to ensure that the proposal wouldn't cause harm to, in terms of loss of privacy for the residents at numbers 34 to 44 Sullivan Crescent, uh, revised drawings were submitted showing that the first floor windows would be angled with the panel or the section of the window facing towards the rear gardens of numbers 34 to 40 being conditioned to be obscure glazed and non-opening up to 1.8 meters uh, from the finished floor level. So subject to that condition, officers are satisfied that the proposal wouldn't cause harm to the living conditions of neighboring occupiers. Um, I just wanted to quickly also mention about the relationship between the house on plot six and uh, the boundary shared with the properties at numbers 30, 40, 40, 40, Sullivan Crescent. So at the closest point, um, if I go back to the proposed site plan because it's larger, so I'm talking about this house here. So at the closest point, there would be one metre separation distance between the proposed dwelling um, and the rear boundaries are shared with 34. Um, so in order to mitigate that harm, um, the dwellings on these two plots whoops, have been intentionally designed with a hip roof profile in order to reduce the overall bulk and massing of the buildings. Um, and also, um, I've not I mentioned the angle windows, and we've also taken into account the separation distance uh, between uh, the rear windows of numbers 34 and 40 and the windows proposed on the front elevations of the proposed dwelling. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the consultation process. So in terms of consultation, nine objections from individual residents were received at the time that the committee report was drafted. An additional, an additional objection was received during the reconsultation period. As mentioned, revised drawings were received. So neighboring residents were given the opportunity uh, to be able to comment on those revised drawings. Um, the additional objection that was received raised concerns about parking, traffic, access, for the council's refuse collection vehicle and emergency services. Um, these planning considerations were um, considered and assessed in section 7.1 of the committee report. It should also be noted that the council's high race department is satisfied that the proposal would not present a risk to road safety, hinder the free flow of traffic or lead to parking stress. 
The application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to the conditions listed in section two of the committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Right, thank you. Roz, do you want to come in for a reply? Okay. Um, yeah, we open it to the floor. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I just want to, uh, I've got a few points I just want to tease out, um, but I just wanted to try and get an understanding from officers. How much weight should this committee place on the previous approval that was granted in 2011? So that'd be just good to understand where, where we can and can't go on that. Um, so anyone want to pick that up? Nisha? Sorry, could you, did you just say how much weight? weight. How much weight in yeah, terms of our sure. consideration do we need to place on? fact that they, this has been previously approved, albeit okay. years ago now. Um, I would say some weight has been provided or given to the previous permission. What I would say is that the permission in 2011 was assessed against a different local plan. Since then, we've updated a new, we've adopted a new plan. So this current application has been assessed against the current policy. Um, and also the previous permission wasn't implemented. Um, so essentially it falls away. So again, that gives it less weight as opposed to, let's say hypothetically, a permission that could be implemented should be given more weight because the applicant could go ahead with that development in this case because it's 2011 it, it lapsed essentially so they couldn't implement it implement it okay council Tuckers. no thank you just come back with a, a couple yes, of other please. bits I, I note from the report that there's a an amenity shortfall albeit minuscule of, of six square meters i think and we saw that there was a, a park it would be nice at some point if that park was upgraded i think um but that's for for another group of people in the council. Um, can I just test with officers the width of that access road? Um, I think it's in the report, but I'd just be useful to sort of understand what the width of that access road was. Yeah. Nisha? Or, or Sophie, actually. More Sophie than Nisha. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm just referring to the report. It says that the proposal would widen the existing access point from Sullivan Crescent to a width of 9.9 .9 metres. Um, this proposed width includes the new foot ray provision measuring 2.5 meters, which would become an extension to the existing adopted high ray. Um, what I would say is that two cars would be able to pass each other um, if that's where you're getting at in terms of high ray safety. So if you would you like to add anything on that? No, I su support what uh, Nisha said there. Thank you very much. No, okay, thank Chairs you. Tuckle. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? No? So. Someone has to take me away here, so. I'll come back with another point, if I may. Yes, sure. Jim. So, I've, I've looking at the pictures, there's quite a uniformed um, materials for the existing houses, you know, 40, 42, 40, 34, that we can see there. Is there any anything in, in the plan for, you know, matching the materials to the existing dwellings that are in Sullivan Crescent? Knowing Sullivan Crescent, there's a new development there, and then there's some other houses, so it's going to be a bit difficult which ones they're going to match it to. Yeah, I think the if I may come back, Mr. Chairman, yeah. it's just that the images we saw, um, that, that's it. That, those ones there, they sort of wouldn't want sort of something which sits outside of what is already there and, and sort of becomes a bit of a, an impact on the street scene, if that were yeah. possible. Well, I think that's a good idea. We'll keep it in that sort of mo mode, if that's okay, officers. I don't know, do we need to have a condition on that, or is it in there? No, um, so there is a condition requiring details in terms of the external finish and materials to be submitted for approval. Um, given that changes were made to ensure that the height of the proposed terrace houses would match that of the houses at numbers 42, um, 42 and 44, um, it would make sense that the materials also matched or as similar as close as possible to the existing houses on Sullivan Crescent well in this section of Sullivan Crescent because um, as mentioned there are um, there are new houses or newer development that's of a different brick material further down the road thank you Nisha Councillor Cawthorn thank you question in relation to um, something on page 209 uh, there's reference to the P-Town rating uh, uh, being very poor, and we all know about Harefield and accessibility, I know it well enough as, well as you do. Uh, I'm just wondering how that impacts on the uh, parking space provision. Uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Sure. 
Um, sure. So in this case, we have given considerable weight to the lower PTAR rating of the site, which is why there's an over-provision. So um, we acknowledge that it doesn't comply with the London plan's requirements because they're providing more car parking spaces than what would be required by the London plan. However, on balance, given the low PTAR rating of the site, we do have concerns that we didn't want to um, increase any street parking demand on Sullivan Crescent, which is why we consider the over-provision to be acceptable in this instance. Thank you, Nisha. Councillor Duck, will you want to come back? Sorry. Um, no, I think um, listening to, to the points raised, and, and, and I have to say it's not often that we get presented with, um, we've had two tonight now, but it's not often we get presented with an increase in family dwellings. You know, this is, what, four family dwellings? Uh, three threes and one four. Um, so I think given that it's heavily conditioned and um, what it proposes, I'd happily move officer's recommendation. Thank you. So I propose that. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Cawthorn. Councillor Cawthorn, did you want to... Uh, I've seconded that, that's I've all. I have nothing to, to add to that. <laughs> no, you have to tell me, I can't. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. I, I have it's to been have a long day, Chairman, forgive I, me. I've, I've tried, but it didn't work. Councillor Singh, did you want to come in? And we, um, Councillor Cawthorn is second, so I'm quite happy with the officer's okay. recommendation. Thank you very much. So, that is proposed and seconded. You have a show of hands. We're all in favour of this point. That's unanimous. That brings us to a meeting to the end of this meeting. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, I also like to sort of say to the committee, you know, planning committees have been getting a lot of flack lately, but there's a lady that came up to us, and unfortunately she, that she got a refusal, she came up to me during, and the cameras could see it, so I just want to make sure it's very clear and open about it. And she actually came and said, congratulations us as a committee, and said that it was really well run, and she appreciated, although she didn't, like the outcome, but she thought we were, did a really good job and very respectful to everybody concerned. So well done, everybody. And on that note, I'll say good night. Thank you.